Good morning, Ray. Ray, can you hear me?
Ray, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm good. <laughs> Should we move to the real session? I see that Dr. Alaniz is already there too. Yes. Uh, let me turn it on in one second. Perfect. How are you? Good. How are tired? you Tired? I'm tired. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be fine. Yes. Don't turn it on right now. Perfect. I mostly just wanted to make sure I was I had the right link. <laughs> so hop <Perfect>. on. <laughs> so you have the right. right link and you yes. have you're gonna share your presentation, right? I'm gonna share my presentation. Let me make sure I have that. And then I can help you with the questions at the end because sometimes it's overwhelming to try to look at them and answer. So okay. usually there is a lot of questions. At least we got yesterday. a lot of questions, yes. We got a lot of questions, yes. I'm going to turn my camera off and then I'll be back in 10 minutes.
Good morning, good evening. Welcome to our patient family colorectal and urogenital meeting. We try to run these meetings every year because we do believe that empowering patients and families with education is the best chance for success and to change for better colorectal and urogenital care. So I know there are people logging in from several countries. So far, we have seen Scotland, Budapest, Spain, Turkey, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, and the United States. If I didn't mention your country, please, uh, Somalia. So please type in the chat and we'll be happy to acknowledge. The first speaker this morning is Dr. Veronica Alanis. She is the gynecologist for the International Center for Colorectal and Urogenital Care in uh, Children's Hospital Colorado, a great partner, and I could not be more proud to have her seeing all the female patients uh, from prenatal, newborn, until they are at, um, at an older age. So welcome everyone and welcome Dr. Alanis. Uh, thank you so much for letting me present today. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to share my screen and get that um, set up, and then I'll start my presentation. Um, okay. I think we're seeing presenter mode. Okay, I'm going to swap the display. Give me a minute. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. So um, as Dr. Bischoff mentioned, I'm the um, I'm an OBGYN and um, I have uh, training in pediatric and adolescent gynecology and provide really gynecologic care across the lifespan from infancy to adolescence. And then I have an adult practice as well. So I'm going to be talking about gynecologic and obstetric um, concerns in patients with anal rectal malformations. And really concerns can arise during all stages of life. We can see GYN issues during infancy, um, during puberty, with sexual function, and then with fertility and pregnancy. Um, during infancy and childhood, really my role is to evaluate the reproductive anatomy. And so we can do this with preoperative imaging, including um, a cloacogram in patients that have a cloaca uh, MRI. Um, at the time of primary repair, so patients that are undergoing a PSARP or PSARVUP, um, I'll often perform an exam under anesthesia and vaginoscopy to evaluate um, the vagina and cervix or cervixes. Um, and then with any abdominal surgery, um, um, taking that opportunity as well to look inside the anatomy at the reproductive tract. And we do this because we know that um, malarian or uterine anomalies are common in patients with um, anal rectal malformations. The most common uterine anomaly that we see is a double system, which we call a didelphus uterus. Um, that is uterine duplication. So the uterus forms from these two tubes that kind of migrate and fuse in the midline to typically form one uterus. And this develops when those two tubes just don't quite fuse um, together. And we see this in about 35% of patients overall, and it's more common in patients with a cloaca. Um, the other anomaly that we see is um, a genesis. A genesis means that um, like under or absent development. So this is where the uterus and um, vagina don't develop normally or are very small and um, underdeveloped. Overall, about five um, and a half percent. And we see this um, most commonly in patients with a recto vestibular fistula and about 11 percent. So what does this mean um, for, for um, young women or um, girls and young women? In, in childhood, it really has no implications. Like there's no implications of having like a uterine anomaly or a vaginal anomaly. Um, but we can see um, implications as girls grow into adolescence and adulthood. So with uterine and vaginal duplication, which is that most common malarian anomaly, we can see patients present with um, pain during intercourse. So if that 
um, if the vagina is duplicated, it, there's essentially like a band of tissue that divides it in half and we can see um, pain with intercourse or difficulty using uh, menstrual hygiene products, specifically tampons. So girls will place a tampon in one vagina or one side of the vagina, but then leak out from the other side. Um, and this is if that septum is left in place. Oftentimes, if we see it and we can take it down during the repair, we will. If it's not accessible, that's totally okay. It can easily be taken down or removed um, during adolescence or adulthood. And then um, with pregnancy specifically, um, with a double uterus, um, there are some pregnancy risks, including like growth restriction, meaning the baby essentially doesn't have enough room to grow, early delivery, malpresentation. So for a, for a baby to deliver vaginally it has to be head down. And sometimes there's just not enough room to make that flip um, and then need for a C-section. Um, with vaginal agenesis or malarian agenesis, where those structures just don't um, develop completely, about 80% of patients will have complete malarian agenesis. So no development of the uterus or vagina. And then some, about 20%, will have partial vaginal agenesis, meaning the uterus develops, but the lower part of the vagina doesn't fully develop, only, only the upper part of the vagina develops. And so some patients will require during their initial surgery, vaginal reconstruction as part of their surgery. This we do in patients who have cloaca or patients who have other anal rectal malformations with some degree of vaginal agenesis. And ideally our goal is always to use native vagina. We know that native vagina, meaning the vagina that's there and that they're born with um, is the best um, in terms of like long-term um, outcomes and function. But sometimes we can't, um, there's just not enough um, or we can't use native vagina. So some patients with um, anal rectal malformation who need uh, vaginal reconstruction will have a graft in place of um, in place for their vagina. So that means tissue is taken from somewhere else and replaced to function as vagina. And so some grafts, and it really depends on like the patient, their prognosis for bowel control, um, other health concerns or medical concerns, what their anatomy looks like. So each case is really individualized, but some other grafts that may um, be used as part of a vaginal reconstruction um, include like taking a piece of the rectum, taking a piece of the colon, rarely small bowel, and then other tissue grafts are being considered as well. And um, in the future, we may have more options, in, including other types of tissue grafts. Um, during infancy or in that like newborn period, the most significant gynecologic problem that we see is hydrocopos. This means um, distension or where the vagina is being filled with fluid. And that fluid is usually um, urine or mucus. And the treatment is to drain that fluid. If it can be done with a catheter, that's fine. Or if it drains spontaneously, that's fine. But in significant, uh, like when hydrocopos is significant, those often need like a little tube to drain that uh, fluid. Um, and then if a vaginal septum is identified, that duplication of the vagina, then um, we can consider taking that down during the um, reconstructive surgery if it's accessible. And then um, moving on to the next stage, puberty, um, we know that girls with um, anal rectal malformations have normally developed ovaries and puberty development occurs as expected. So normal, we expect a normal puberty because those ovaries develop normally, independent of how the uterus develops. Um, but effective menstruation, so me, um, periods, requires adequate uterine development. So we're always looking to make sure that the uterus develop normally. It has, you have to have like the lining of the uterus and a patent or open vagina for that menstrual blood to come out. Um, so we do see some menstrual concerns in girls with um, anal rectal malformations. Some um, times we identify those underdeveloped or absent structures during puberty um, um, that that uh, may may not have been um, identified, you know, during infancy. Um, and then we can also see obstruction of menstrual flow, meaning that menstrual flow can't get out of the vagina. 
And this can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's another block in the um, uterine or malarian system that, that girls are born with that we didn't identify early. Um, or it could be um, a result of surgery that was done, like narrowing of the vagina resulting in um, blocked um, period periods. So during puberty, it's really important for us and for the gynecologist on the team to assess those reproductive structures again, because we know that those differences are very common. We, we um, want to reevaluate those reproductive structures. The truth is that during infancy um, and when girls are babies, they're just so, so small. So we do our best to characterize the anatomy, but um, we get better a better idea and better pictures as girls go through puberty and are a little bit older because estrogen causes the uterine structures to grow and develop. So um, really important to assess those structures again during puberty. We do that this with a combination of ultrasound. If we can't see what we need on ultrasound, then we might get an MRI. If the patient has had surgery of the vagina, we want to reevaluate how that vagina has healed during puberty. Again, no implications during childhood. Girls don't need a vagina during childhood. So it's really during adolescence and puberty again that we start to reevaluate those structures. So we might do a vaginoscopy to evaluate how the vagina has healed um, during puberty. If the patient has is needing to go to the operating room for whatever whatever reason, you know, a Malone, a bladder surgery, whatever, we could take that opportunity to evaluate the internal reproductive structures. So look at the uterus, look at the fallopian tubes, and we can check to see if the fallopian tubes are open during that surgery. And then examination of the vaginal opening. Again, and especially in girls who have had vaginal surgery as part of their reconstruction, um, looking at the vaginal opening, which we can start with in clinic. And then if we need to do a more detailed exam, considering that with anesthesia. Um, if we identify blocked um, or menstrual obstruction where the period blood is not coming out, um, we have treatment options for this. Um, pre Preoperatively, we um, um, gynecology will often recommend what we call menstrual suppression. So if there is any evidence that that period blood is getting stuck somewhere, we don't want our girls to have any more bleeding. And so we'll give hormones to essentially stop menstrual bleeding. And then um, if it's significant, um, significant blockage and, and our girls are in pain, we can use our colleagues in radiology to help us drain or take out some of that blood. Um, or we can surgically place a tube in the uterus or the vagina to help decompress or take out some of that blood. Um, but these girls will need some sort of definitive surgical management for menstrual obstruction really depends on the case and like where the level, where it's blocked, you know, if it's something that she was born with or something that was acquired or a result of surgery. But sometimes those surgical options include things like a revision or redo vaginoplasty where we open up the vagina if another um, septum, or this is like typically something that girls are born with is identified, we'll take that down. And then in very, very rare cases, um, we consider removing the uterus. And this would really be, um, this is reserved for cases where future fertility is really not an option for our patients. And we've tried and failed other more conservative options. And here in the United States, um, we, we, we cannot, do hysterectomy in minors without like um, an ethics consult and even sometimes court order. So it has to be medically indicated um, and in conjunction with an ethics committee. Some of the options for menstrual suppression. So again, um, or sorry, um, these would be indications for menstrual suppression. So again, if that um, blood is being blocked or there's some level of obstruction, we're gonna offer hormonal suppression. But also we know that our girls with or without an air with with or without an anorectum inflammation may have just problems with their periods. And this is where gynecology can step in and really provide some support and relief. So painful periods, that's also known as dysmenorrhea, heavy menstrual bleeding. And then if there are hygiene concerns, so, um, you know, having a, a period is just difficult from a hygiene perspective. These are all reasonable options or reasonable, reasonable reasons to consider hormonal therapy to make periods lighter or make them go away.
some of the, these are just some of the options that we consider. There are pills, um, there are patches that girls can put on their skin, injections. You know, if the, um, uh, girls have a single uterus, we can consider an IUD or an implant that goes underneath the skin of the arm. All right, so then moving on to um, sexual function, um, there are many factors that affect sexual function. It is complicated, but some of those factors that can affect sexual function include anatomy. So we know if there is narrowing or scarring in the vagina from prior surgeries, that can affect sexual function, relationship status, medical comorbidities. So girls who struggle with fecal um, or urinary incontinence may struggle or may have um, concerns with sexual functions. In fact, one of Dr. Wilcox's studies, who you're going to hear from next, um, um, he reported that patients with more urinary and fecal incontinence did score um, higher in terms of having sexual um, anxiety. Spinal cord anomalies can affect sensation. Um, adhesive disease can sometimes cause pain. There are psychosocial factors and then certainly body image. So lots of things can affect sexual function. Um, we, um, it's really important that the vagina be examined um, prior to engaging in any sexual activity in all patients that have had vaginal surgery. Um, and so we, you know, we know that narrowing or scarring can occur um, with vaginal surgery, and we want to make sure that we evaluate that before um, our patients are using the vagina so that we don't create like any traumatic experiences. If there's narrowing, we um, can offer treatment. So sometimes that narrowing is, is very mild and can just be stretched out with a process that we call vaginal dilation. And then in some cases, surgery is needed. Um, we did a survey looking at sexual function recently in um, patients with anal rectum malformation, and sexual function is a concern in our patients. Um, in this cohort, about um, a third of them were not engaging in sexual activity. The rest that were engaging in sexual activity reported, you know, vaginal discomfort in about, you know, 25% of those patients' difficulty with vaginal lubrication. Um, but there were also some, um, there were a lot of patients that reported satisfying um, sexual activity. So a third, no difficulties, and then a third enjoyed and found sexual activity satisfying. So, um, you know, this is another opportunity opportunity for gynecology to get involved and just help our um, patients with any issues that they have regarding sexual function and se sexual satisfaction. Routine GYN care is also very important, you know, just routine pelvic exams and cervical cancer screening in our patients with anal rectal malformation. We looked at this in a cohort of patients and, and found that the majority of females with anal rectal malformations had their routine cervical cancer screening or pap tests in the clinic. And so it's totally fine for, you know, most girls to, to start and receive this um, routine care in the clinic. Those with more complex malformations, as we would expect, girls who've had vaginal um, surgery or a vaginal reconstruction with a graft, did report um, greater discomfort with the exam. And then um, moving on to fertility. So um, the truth is that outcome data regarding fertility in patients with um, anal rectal malformations is limited. Um, we know we have experience and we know that patients um, can get pregnant, that spontaneous conception is possible, but it appears that patients with more complex anorectal malformations, so those um, with more complex anorectal malformations uh, may have lower childbirth rates. And this is likely mul multifactorial. These patients with more complex anorectal malformations are more likely to have differences in the way the uterus develops. They may have um, had multiple surgeries, which can result in scar tissue and scar tissue around the fallopian tube can result in tubal infertility. The tube needs to be like very mobile to pick up that egg. Um, iatrogenic damage. So it, it's possible that a fallopian tube was injured or an ovary or part of the uterus was removed um, um, during surgery. In patients that have had um, blockages or um, menstrual obstruction, we can see endometriosis. So the blood essentially goes out the fallopian tube 
implants in different parts of the pelvis and abdomen, and that can cause infertility. And then the psychosocial factors as well. So um, complicated and multifactorial. Um, and um, this was another um, study where we looked at fertility concerns and outcomes in patients with anal rectal malformations. And our patients do have concerns and do report fertility problems. So concerns about fertility were reported in about one third of patients overall. Um, and um, we see that fertility concerns are highest in patients with a diagnosis of cholega. So with regards to fertility, it's um, very important that anatomy be evaluated early and often so that we can anticipate um, any issues related to fertility. Again, we want to anticipate like um, any issues with uh, menstrual obstruction and we want to prevent that so that we um, minimize risk of endometriosis and pain and damage to the malarian structures. And then workup for infertility and referral to a specialist should be considered early, especially in those patients with more complex anatomy, because we know that there are lower rates of fertility in patients with complex anatomy. Um, in our patients that do get pregnant, these patients, um, well, one, prior to trying to get pregnant, we recommend preconception counseling. Um, so meeting with a high-risk OB doctor because these patients, um, patients often have multiple comorbidities. We can see other anomalies, um, other cardiac, GI, spinal anomalies, renal anomalies. We know that malarian anomalies are common, which can affect um, um, or increases risk during pregnancy. And then there's often a complicated surgical history. So prior to getting pregnant, we recommend preconception counseling so that we have a good plan in place for pregnancy monitoring and delivery. Um, and then um, um, routine OB care with a, a high-risk OB doctor as well. And then our patients that do get pregnant and are getting ready for delivery, the delivery really depends on the type of anal rectal malformation and the patient's surgical history. So patients with a rectovestibular or rectoperineal fistula are probably okay for a vaginal birth, um, though we do recommend you know, evaluating the perineum, um, assessing patient's bowel control, and in patients that have good bowel control, we really recommend or want to emphasize minimizing the risk for sphincter injury. So injury to the anus and the muscles around the anus. Um, we don't want to um, worsen bowel control in our patients that have good bowel control. And so to minimize those risks, we recommend like not pushing for a very long time and then not um, um, no assisted delivery with like forceps or vacuum. Any patient that has um, a has had a reconstructed cloaca or vaginal surgery or vaginal replacement as part of the reconstruction really should have a C-section to minimize injury or damage to that reconstruction. And I think that was my last slide. So thank you very much for letting me present um, and I will take any questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Alanis, for this comprehensive um talk. Before I open for questions, I just want to remember patients and parents that this is a public meeting. So be careful with the information that you share. Try to avoid anything that you don't want others to know. You can ask general questions, not specifically about your condition or your child condition. So one question that was submitted before your lecture was, when should a vaginoscopy be performed? So um, we recommend doing the vaginoscopy, uh, vaginoscopy at the time of uh, repair to get a general sense of anatomy. So patient, so certainly it's being done if a patient has had a cloaca, it's part of um, the evaluation. But even in patients with a rectovestibular or rectoperineal fistula, there is a risk of malarian anom anomalies. And so doing the vaginoscopy at, at that repair just will give us an idea of what to expect for the future. And then um, at puberty, definitely, um, again, we wanna reevaluate that vaginal opening and vagina um, with anybody who has had vaginal surgery. The other question is, what is the follow-up that you recommend for females with a gynecologist? Yeah, it's, it's really 
patient dependent it really depends on the history and the diagnosis. Again, anybody with a malarian anomaly or who has had vaginal surgery is going to be seeing me very regularly, um, especially during puberty and into adulthood. In patients with like a rectovestibular or rectoperineal fistula that has confirmed normal um, reproductive structures, so single uterus, single um, um, vagina, um, and has not had any vaginal surgery, they really just need to do routine GYN. So I usually check in just around puberty to just to check in and see how things are going. And then as needed for any like menstrual concerns, you know, other routine GYN issues. More questions. Do patients with didelphus always have two services? Yes, by definition, yes. Didelphus is a complete duplication of the uterus, so two cervixes. There are some variations, so some slight variations where you may have like a unicornuate uterus and then just a horn on one side without like a true cervix, but that is like that has a, a different name. It's a unicornate uterus with a communicating or non-communicating horn. But by definition, didelphus has two cervixes. The other question, out of curiosity, when uh, uterine anomalies um, in anorectal malformation were discovered, for example, hydrocopos? Um, sorry, I'm not quite understanding the the question, oh, it's like, like historically, when did we start um, noticing this association? Andrea, I might defer this question to you because I know that, um, you know, you've been doing this a, a long time, but I think, you know, it was, I think it was in the, the 80s, 80s, like yes. really when Dr. Pena started doing these procedures, he noticed this association and then started getting gynecology involved. So the first posterior sagittal approach for the repair of anorectal malformation was in 1980. And the first posterior sagittal approach for the cloaca repair was 1982. And as Dr. Pena followed those patients, he started seeing anatomic variations, including duplication of the structures, identifying during the newborn period that it was a cloaca because for a long time it was thought to be a rectovaginal fistula or imperforate anus with urogenital sinus. They had other names for it. So it was in the 80s. Okay, I think those are all the questions, Dr. Alanis. Oh, there's one more. What does long-term care for a sigmoid vaginal plasty look like? Are there risks associated with a vaginal canal made of colon? That's a very good question. That is a very good question. Um, so, so yes, anytime we do a surgery, there's always risks and benefits, and there are risks with and benefits with a sigmoid vaginal plasty. Um, so some of the um, concerns or some of the issues that we can see long-term are like inflammation of the, the neovaginal walls. Um, we can see uh, mucus production, um, sometimes um, prolapse of those tissues. And these are all things that we can assess and treat if a patient um, um, is struggling with those issues. Some of the benefits are that generally a sigmoid vaginoplasty provides like good length and width um, for, for um, vagina. Um, but yes, in a patient that's had a sigmoid vaginoplasty, they should be seeing a gynecologist who's familiar um, with neovaginas at least once a year. One more question. Are chronic yeast infections normal for a child with imperforate anus and had a vaginal fistula? So I am not aware of any increased risk of um, yeast infections um, um, in terms of like vulvar. In, in, in general, we don't see vaginal yeast infections in young patients. This is something that we start to see in older adolescents. But in terms of just like chronic or just like di diaper um, yeast infections, I'm not aware of an, an increased risk. Wonderful. I think we answered all the questions Thank you so much, Dr. Alanis. And I know you're going to introduce Dr. Wilcox, our next presenter, and then I will be helping him with the questions too. Thank you. All right. So um, our next present uh, presenter for the conference today is Dr. Duncan Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox is the surgeon in chief for Children's Hospital Colorado, Colorado and is the pediatric urologist on our team. So I will let him take over and share his slides.
Thank you very much. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bishop, for the opportunity to present this. Um, you know, families, I, I think, are often uh, a little confused as to why uh, a baby born with an imperfect anus uh, needs to have a urological follow-up. <clears throat> and what I hope to do today is to show uh, why all patients born uh, with imperfect anus regardless of the type, uh, need a full urological evaluation and follow-up uh, and, until they're uh, potty trained or socially continent and, and don't have any other urological problems. So the, the goals uh, for urological management are to maximize long-term kidney function, uh, as we know that somewhere between six and 10% of patients will develop uh, impaired kidney function requiring some form of kidney replacement therapy. Uh, to follow patients up until they're developing urinary continence, either through normal voiding or through some uh, alternative means to help them gain social continence. Uh, and then to preserve uh, gonad function, and in particular for us, uh, the testicle, uh, as Dr. Amelie's and her team uh, concentrate more on the ovarian function. So if we look at all anorectal anomalies, about 80% of them will have some sort of renal anomaly. Uh, and this can be a, a, a minor anomaly, such as a low-grade psychouroteric reflux, which is when urine is in the bladder and goes up into the kidney. Uh, or it can be a much more complicated related to absence of the, the kidney or uh, hydronephrosis. Uh, so there's some sort of degree of blockage in the kidney. Um, and clearly we, we need to investigate that. So we manage those patients in the appropriate way. They actually need to be managed just the same as other patients who don't have anorectal anomalies. And thankfully many of them don't require surgical intervention, but it's important that we identify them. It's also uh, common to see patients with spinal anomalies. About 40% of anorectal patients will have some sort of spinal anomaly. And because the nerves that control the bladder are the last nerves to leave the spine, it's very frequent that we see patients with spinal anomalies have problems in the way the bladder works, which can lead uh, to problems with urinary tract infections. And about half of boys born with an anorectal anomaly have some sort of genital anomaly. And these uh, congenital problems can lead to uh, urinary tract infections, or problems with urinary incontinence, and later in life, uh, sexual dysfunction. So what is the role of urology? Um, I, I think this can be divided into pre-reconstruction, during the reconstruction, and then following the reconstruction that Dr. Bishop and her team do. So pre-reconstruction, I think the most important thing is to evaluate the whole genital urinary tract to make sure uh, we know exactly what we're dealing with, much in the same way that Dr. Alanis uh, said the same for the genital um, tract in females. Uh, and this uh, will involve a number of investigations, both of the urinary tract, but also of the spine. We also need to manage urinary tract infections if they happen prior to uh, reconstruction. Uh, during reconstruction, uh, there are uh, a number of areas that, that we can help. The first is uh, we can help with understanding the anatomy by doing uh, endoscopy, so placing a small camera uh, into the urethra uh, and looking at exactly how the urethra and bladder have formed, where the uh, rectum comes into the urinary tract. And then in girls, um, also looking at the vagina um, and how the vagina, the urethra and the rectum all interact. So we have a much better understanding of what we need to do at the time of reconstruction. Also, uh, about 50% um, of boys will have some sort of genital anomaly that may require uh, reconstruction. And, and it's important uh, to try and minimize uh, anesthetics. So we try very hard to combine those reconstructions with the, one of the surgical operations on the anus. 
And typically, uh, we do this at the time of colostomy closure uh, because it's uh, e easiest to do at that time because the patient is lying flat uh, where during the reconstruction, they tend to be lying uh, on their stomach. And following reconstruction, uh, we ha have a role in protecting renal function uh, to ensure we maximize the, the lifespan of the kidneys um, to enable normal urinary continence uh, and to deal with any gentle problems as they arise uh, both early and uh, in adulthood. So the first investigation we do, uh, usually within uh, two or three days of birth, is an ultrasound scan. The ultrasound scan can tell us uh, exactly what the kidneys look like, uh, where the kidneys are present, because the kidneys in, in anorectal anomalies can not have moved into the normal place, so they can be sitting in the pelvis or uh, joined in a so-called horseshoe kidney or cross-fused uh, kidney. And also we're looking to see how well the kidneys drain. And we can do that, as you see here, by looking at the back pressure of urine. So in, this, in the lower middle panel, you can see that there's a lot of darkness, that's urine, which hasn't drained properly. And so these are the things that we need to see uh, on ultrasound scan. At the same time, we usually get an ultrasound of the spine because in the first three months of life, you can see very clearly uh, how the lower part of the spine has developed. Uh, and that will uh, act uh, as a way of evaluating whether we need to do more complicated tests such as MRI scans. In patients who have completely normal ultrasounds, it's probably uh, not necessary to do other uh, renal uh, studies. But if there's any abnormality at all, so that's an abnormality of position or of join, or if the kidneys have some degree of hydronephrosis or back pressure or backup of urine, then we tend to do a renal scan, as you see here. This is a test that we normally do around three months of age because the kidney in the first few uh, months of life uh, does not uh, have the normal concentrating power uh, of a, a slightly older kidney. And so consequently, the images we can get uh, at three months are, are much superior to those earlier on. And uh, what a renal scan will show is how each individual kidney is functioning. So we can see split function. And we can also see how the kidneys drain. And so we can get a very good idea of what the baseline for that kidney is and how we need to follow that child up. Um, fortunately, most patients who have a hydronephrosis or a back pressure of urine resolve on their own um, as children age, but we do need to follow them up regularly. Um, and we also need to uh, be aware that if they have a significant back filling of urine, they're at an increased risk of urinary tract infections, and it may be worth uh, placing them on prophylactic antibiotics. Um, reflux of urine, which requires a catheter to be placed in the bladder and then contrast placed, um, is something that is very variable. Um, some centers uh, give everyone a, a VCUG or a study to look for reflux. Uh, others, uh, and we're one of those, are, are more selective in who we uh, perform a VCUG in. And this really depends uh, a lot on your approach to the management of the psychoureteric reflux. So uh, what are the causes of impaired renal function? And they can basically be divided into two. So the congenital causes, so some of these uh, children, are typically those with a more complex anorectal anomaly, such as a cloaca or a bladder neck, fistula, it can often have uh, uh, an absent kidney or a kidney that hasn't developed normally. And so these patients start life with a much more reduced renal capacity. Um, clearly, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but what we can do something about is the acquired problems. And so patients who have urinary tract infections, especially those that go up to the kidney, um, can damage um, their uh, remaining renal function. And then patients who have bladder problems, specifically if they have a high pressure bladder, which I'll go into in, in more detail, can lead to further back pressure and difficulty with voiding, which can lead to further damage of the kidneys. In order to ensure that we understand exactly what the renal function is, uh, we can measure renal function relatively early in life. Um, and we can do that through blood tests. 
And there are two blood tests that we frequently do. One is a creatinine. Creatinine is a protein that is um, uh, put into the bloodstream through breakdown of muscle cells, and then it is removed through the kidney. Um, and, and that historically has been how we've measured renal function. Uh, but more recently, there is cystatin C. Cystatin C has the benefit that it's produced by all cells and is, it is removed by the kidney. And, and higher cystatin Cs, and obviously this varies with age, but higher cystatin Cs uh, lead to um, in, indicate in, impaired renal function. And by knowing the patient's age and sex and size, we can then calculate what's called a glomerular filtration rate, which is a very accurate way of assessing renal function. And so increasing your C, and, and we certainly do this, uh, we, we'll measure cystatin C estimated gen glomerular filtration rate on the vast majority of our patients unless they have completely normal kidneys on ultrasound scan. The first year or two of life, um, the kidney matures. And so the, the glomerular filtration rate or the renal function does increase uh, over the first two years of life. So it's not as accurate then, but does definitely give us an indicator of how things will go. In terms of uh, urinary tract infections that occur prior to reconstruction, there are really three uh, reasons why this is. The most common is that feces coming through the colostomy goes into the mucous fissure or the distal limb. And because that's connected still to the urinary tract, you're essentially mixing feces with urine, which leads to problems with urinary tract infection. And, and we can uh, usually manage that relatively simply by just washing out the the fecal uh, matter within that uh, limb. Uh, and obviously uh, what we hope to do is to separate the two stomas far enough that that's not possible that feces can go through. Some patients have uh, an inability to empty their bladder and stasis of urine causes urinary tract infections. And that can also be true if you have the psychoureteric reflux or backflow of urine up into the kidneys. And so uh, sometimes, although fortunately not that commonly, uh, we need to maximize bladder drainage if the child isn't able to empty the bladder just by voiding. Um, and uh, we can do that uh, through a variety of ways, um, sometimes just through pressure, uh, sometimes through clean intermittent catheterization, which actually can often be quite difficult to achieve. And rarely uh, we need to do an operation to allow drainage uh, until we can fully understand exactly what's going on and, and then uh, change that uh, after the reconstruction. So uh, following reconstruction, uh, we, we our number one goal is to protect renal function. A and the ways we can do that are to minimize urinary tract infections, to manage any underlying congenital renal problems. So if there's a blockage to flow of urine, that requires surgical intervention, we can remove that blockage. And it's rare that we need to do that um, earlier than the first year of life, but sometimes it is. And then what we need to do is we need to maximize bladder mechanics so that the urine is released and excreted in a consistent, complete way uh, so we, we don't have problems with continence and urinary tract infections. So the way uh, we uh, minimize urinary tract infections is we ensure maximum bladder emptying. The most important thing I think we do um, is to improve constipation. And, and I know that uh, Dr. Bischoff is talking about bowel management later in the day. Um, and we, we have found that by managing the bowels through the bowel management, if necessary, we can significantly improve the urinary tract, urinary tract emptying and urinary tract infections without doing anything at all, but managing the constipation. Uh, sometimes we need to give uh, low doses of antibiotics or prophylactic antibiotics. And usually we do this in the first couple of years of life because during that time, the kidneys are more susceptible to renal damage following urinary tract infections. So, Moving on now to incontinence, there are a number of things uh, that are risk factors for incontinence. So if you have problems with the spine, so the nerves that control the bladder are, are impacted, uh, then you can have uh, problems with coordination 
uh, leading to urinary incontinence. The more severe the anomaly, so uh, a cloacal anomaly or an anomaly in which the rectum enters higher up in the urinary tract, so closer to the bladder or the sphincter mechanism, uh, can uh, increase the risk. Um, some patients uh, have a control mechanism which doesn't uh, close properly, uh, even before any surgical reconstruction, uh, and that's something we can evaluate on endoscopy. Uh, occasionally, surgery uh, can lead to problems with um, damage to the sphincter mechanism or uh, incomplete resection of the uh, connection between the anus and the bladder can lead to an out pouch, which can lead to incontinence. Fortunately, if surgery does lead to a problem, it's often temporary. And as I mentioned, constipation is certainly a very big factor. So uh, just briefly looking at how we urinate, if, if you start at number one, what happens is, is that the bladder fills and the muscle within the bladder relaxes. But to, in order to allow the bladder to fill, the control mechanism, the sphincter or the pelvic floor needs to contract. So two things need to happen. The sphincter needs to contract to stop the urine leaking, and then the bladder needs to be able to relax um, under a low pressure. Then as the bladder fills, about halfway through filling, you first get a sensation that you need to avoid. Um, and and if, you, if you have an, an impaired number of nerves going to the bladder, sometimes this first sensation is, is not noticed by children. And so they only notice that they need to avoid when the bladder is very full. And at that point, they have uh, less time. They have urgency in which they need to avoid. Then, they, then you void, and in order to do that, this is, uh, requires the coordination of the sphincter to open first and then the bladder to contract. So there are a number of things where we see this going wrong. The first thing is that sometimes the sphincter doesn't relax, so the bladder is contracting against a sphincter which is closed, which leads to high pressure, leads to incomplete emptying and back pressure of urine. Sometimes the sphincter mechanism is open all the time, in which case the bladder doesn't ever fill and you just get constant dripping of urine. And fortunately, less common, the bladder just doesn't contract well enough, so you're not able to adequately empty the bladder, which leads to overflow incontinence and, and urinary tract infections. So how do we manage and understand voiding dysfunction or abnormalities in voiding? We, we can do that... Um, in a number of ways, and you'll hear people talk about urodynamics, but there are many things we can do before uh, we go to urodynamics. So the first is we can just ask uh, about how frequently you're voiding, uh, how um, the voiding pattern is, uh, whether you have urgency or whether you're just leaking. Um, we can then through a very simple thing, which I'll go through, uh, look at how you actually empty the bladder and how well you empty the bladder just with a simple ultrasound scan. And then if those don't work, then we might move on to what's formal urodynamics or what's actually called a systemetrogram. So in patients who can actually void, we, we ask them to void into a, a, a modified toilet like this. And this has enabled us to look at exactly how the flow of urine is. So what you see is in a normal void, um, you, you're not voiding, the sphincter muscle relaxes, which allows the urine to increase in speed and then uh, decrease in speed, and then the sphincter uh, closes. This is a completely normal void. Sometimes, however, the, the sphincter muscle doesn't relax properly, and that leads to this intermittent uh, curve where you get stop-start stop voiding. And sometimes, as I mentioned, the bladder pressure uh, isn't able to be sufficient enough to get a good void and you just get sort of a very slow void. And then finally, if the sphincter doesn't relax, um, but the bladder contracts, when the sphincter does eventually open, you get this very high pressure, very quick void. And so we're able with this and an ultrasound scan to look at uh, how well you've emptied to get a really good understanding. And, and in the majority of patients, this is all we need to do. Occasionally, we need to do formal urodynamics. And in these, what this involves is putting a catheter into the bladder uh, and a catheter into the bowel. And we can do that either through a colostomy or through the anus. 
And that allows us to measure the pressure in the bladder. And as we fill the bladder, we really can understand the dynamics of the bladder. Obviously, this is an invasive test. Uh, and so we try uh, to minimize uh, how frequently and on whom we do this. But what you see here when you've done neurodynamics is if you look um, at the top line, this is uh, the pressure within the bowel. And, and what you see is a, a, is a very uh, normal uh, bowel contraction, which actually has stimulated the bladder here to contract. Um, and, and this explains why treating constipation can often help treat the bladder, because it is the large bowel contraction, often due to constipation, which forces the bladder to contract, uh, leading to urinary incontinence. So what are the ways in which we can manage voiding dysfunction? So we can do that um, in three areas. One is through emptying. So how can we empty the bladder? Well, we can empty the bladder. Obviously, the best way is through voiding. Um, and even in children who don't no void normally, we can often, um, through a, a education, uh, get children to void or double void so they're able to empty the bladder well. If that's not possible, uh, then, then we may need to start intermittent catheterization. That's when we put a catheter into the bladder, take the urine out, remove the catheter, and then three or four hours later do it the same. And, and we can either do that through the urethra or through a, a channel that we create. We can We need to help coordinate the sphincter and bladder contraction. And the best way for us to do that is through physical therapy, although children need to usually be between five and seven years of age to uh, cooperate with that. Uh, or we can do it through medications. Um, there are medications that help relax the sphincter or injections such as botulinum toxin, which can help the sphincter. And then finally, if the bladder is not big enough or, or is under high pressure, we can use uh, either medications such as anticholinergics or oxybutynin to relax the bladder, a botulinum toxin, which is an injection which works for about six to nine months that can inject, relax the bladder. Or uh, on rare occasions, do we need to make the bladder bigger through a bladder augmentation? So why is this important? This is important because patients who have urinary, ha have imperfect anus, continue to have problems with urinary incontinence. Uh, so this is a, one of many studies looking at uh, uh, adults who are born with imperfect anus. And as you see, about 60% of them have no uh, episodes of incontinence, but um, many of them have either weekly or daily episodes of incontinence. And typically those patients with a more complex problem are more likely to have problems uh, with incontinence. And in these patients, um, if you have a, a less complex or a low anorectal anomaly, you're typically able to void normally. But those patients with a high anorectal anomaly or a cloacal anomaly, uh, many of those patients need assistance in emptying their bladder through either a clean intermittent catheterization or very rarely a, 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 a technique in which the urine just drains into a bag. Unfortunately, we have to do that extremely rarely. So moving on to genital anomalies, uh, the most common genital anomaly is undescended testicle. That happens up to 40% of times. And this typically can be repaired at the time uh, of the colostomy closure. There are also uh, problems with the penis, typically uh, where the urethra doesn't end at the tip of the penis, that's hyperspadius, or when the penis is bent, uh, which is cordy. And once again, these typically can be repaired at the time of colostomy closure. Uh, and we uh, almost always are arrange for that to be done. One of the things that patients with um, anorect male patients with anorectal anomaly have is an increased testicular pain. And, and the, the, the most worrying point is, is when the testicle is twisted, this is called testicular torsion. Because when the testicle twists, um, the blood supply is restricted and if this isn't untwisted within four to six hours, you can sometimes lose uh, that testicle. So this is something uh, that when we see a patient uh, with testicular pain, especially if it's severe uh, and it's been going on for more than 30 or 60 minutes, 
uh, then we really would like to get an ultrasound scan to exclude testicular torsion. However, in patients with anal erectile anomalies, inflammation of the testicle or the tube in which the sperm go is much more uh, common uh, than in, in, in other young men and boys. And so this is something we need to be acutely aware of in, in boys who get testicular pain is to make sure that we're not missing uh, inflammation. Um, fortunately, uh, with improved voiding, uh, we can often uh, minimize uh, the recurrence of this. So uh, what about follow-up? So I, I think that um, all patients with anal rectal anomaly should be seen by a uro urologist and, and they should be followed up until they're potty trained. Um, and if they void normally through the urethra, uh, once they're potty trained and they're not getting urinary tract infections, then I think, uh, it, and they have normal renal function, then I think it's reasonable not to continue to see them. But that leaves many patients who have either problems with urinary tract infection, impaired renal function, or are having problems with continence, those patients uh, need to be followed up forever and then transitioned uh, through to a transitional team. And you'll hear more about that from Dr. Wood later. So the reason to worry about urology uh, to prevent renal damage, um, because about 6% to 10% of patients will have a significant renal damage, to reduce urinary tract infections, which unfortunately occurs in about a quarter of patients, uh, and to improve continence, either normal continence or social continence through uh, other mechanisms so that patients can lead as normal a life as possible. Unfortunately, uh, that can be achieved in the vast majority of patients. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilcox. There are many interesting questions. So the first one is, what about a child who has both kidneys and bladder related issues? So, so if they have um, kidney problems, um, it, it depends a little bit on what it is. So um, some patients uh, uh, unfortunately have kidneys which haven't developed normally. So they have what's called dysplasia. So they haven't got the, the right amount of kidney tissue. In, in those patients, we just have to work really hard to prevent them getting further damage through urinary tract infections, through making sure their bladder is emptying properly. If you have a problem with a bladder and kidneys, it typically means that the bladder isn't working as well. And so that's the patients that we uh, are, are very attuned to and really need to maximize um, urinary drainage. Um, and so sometimes you'll see in those patients that we do a vesicostomy, which is where we just let the bladder drain constantly into the diaper um, and then as they get the need or the desire to be continent that's when we talk about um, closing it and doing further reconstruction um, sometimes uh, patients have kidney problems where the urine is not flowing properly and, and that's something that we can actually fix uh, surgically and we will do that and then manage the bladder separately the other question is how many urinary tract infections uh, are acceptable in order to preserve the kidney? Uh, well, the answer is zero, uh, but, um, but uh, we can't achieve that. So if there are two sorts of urinary tract infections, in my opinion. There's the uh, cystitis. That's a, an infection within the bladder that leads to irritation on voiding, incontinence, sometimes blood, but not uh, a fever, not back pain, those very rarely go on to damage the kidney. Um, if you get problems with um, back pain and fever, then they can damage the kidney. But if you treat it um, with antibiotics within the first 48 hours and ideally within the first 24 hours, you can usually minimize that. Um, and the child is at most at risk of damaging the kidney in the first year or two of life because the kidney is more susceptible to urinary tract infections during that time. So um, if you're getting urinary tract infections, you know, one or two a year, um, especially if they're not febrile, we, obviously we don't like, but we can tolerate. More than that, we really need to affect, work on. Are there risks associated with having two kidneys, but one is much smaller and has impaired function, such as higher risk of infections? 
So that so that depends a little bit on why you have a small kidney. So typically, uh, small kidneys can be related to the psychoureteric reflux. Um, and the psychoureteric reflux makes you slightly more at risk of a urinary tract infection. So if you have a small kidney with um, urinary reflux, then we'll probably put you on prophylactic antibiotics until you get true potty training. Having a small kidney in itself uh, isn't a risk for further urinary tract infections. No. Can bilateral vesicoureteral reflux kick grade five? come back after reimplantation. Sadly, everything can come back after surgery. Um, but so grade five, it, because it's the most, uh, the highest grade, it has the highest risk of recurrence. Um, but if, if, the, if the operation is done well, about eight or nine out of 10 patients will not have recurrence. Um, if you do have recurrence, it's often because the bladder is under high pressure. And so in those patients who get recurrence, we'll often do urodynamics. In fact, we'll always do urodynamics in those patients prior to doing anything further, because we know it's the high pressure that probably needs to be repaired, not the reflux. So you almost answered the next question that it's by the same person. Boys Post-void issue was identified after the grade five reimplantation. Are they related? And epididymitis started post-reimplantation and post-void issues. Are they related? Yes, they're both related. Um, so, uh, firstly, um, if you when, when you have a reimplantation, uh, certainly if you do it early, it's possible to damage the bladder, uh, which can lead to voiding problems. Um, uh, but typically the reflux is secondary to the voiding problems, not the other way around. Um, and sadly, yes, uh, sometimes in boys with imperfect anus, the, the vas which goes to the testicle can implant itself uh, into the ureter, not into the base of the penis. Uh, and that can lead to more problems with um, epididymitis. And so consequently, when you do a reimplant and you, you create a little more pressure, that can force some of the urine to go down uh, into the bass. So, yes. Very important question. Um, a boy had a rectourethral fistula, normal kidney, normal spine, no other anomalies, and he was being fine when he was born. But after his pull-through surgery, he stopped peeing, and we have an, a suprapubic tube now. He was diagnosed with neurogenic bladder. How often do you see this complication happen, and will his bladder function resolve eventually? So uh, unfortunately, this is something we see, um, and that's because the nerves that control the bladder run very close to where the fistula goes into the bladder. Uh, and so sometimes you can see uh, damage to the nerves, uh, but also uh, typically these children have less nerves going to the bladder. So any any little bit of damage to those nerves um, can cause uh, problems with bladder emptying. And and you know we we can't see these nerves; they're they're not visible to us. So it's not like we can avoid them. Um, although we have techniques, or rather Dr. Bischoff and her team have techniques to try and minimize that. Uh, about 20% uh, or two out of 10 will have some change in how the bladder functions after an operation. Uh, fortunately, about half of those will get better within the first year. So if you're, if this child has not, uh, has had the operation less than a year, you may see improvement. If it's been more than a year, I'm afraid it's unlikely to improve. A five years old boy uh, that drips urine accidentally before voiding. Should the mom worry about incontinence? He was born with an imperforate anus. So um, there, there are a number of re reasons for that. Um, a, a lot of boys drip urine just before they void because they, they wait too long. So it could be that this is just normal five-year-old behavior. Um, but one of the things that is concerning, especially if it if sometimes it's a little and sometimes it's a lot, is that the 
the the boy is not getting the signals to empty properly um and and that usually can be managed with just um good voiding habits sometimes if if you void if you're dribbling after voiding then then that is often related to an out pouch um, in the urethra that leads to secondary dribbling and that is something that um, can surgically be corrected Dr. Wilcox, I think we can do a course just for urology based on the amount of questions <laughs> that you got. I, I'm sure you are very busy. You have a very busy schedule, but if you want to answer some of the questions at the question and answer and at the chat, there are questions in both. I will go to the chat. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll be... Um, presenting now about prenatal diagnosis and the early years. So one second. Do you see my screen, Ray? Uh, yes, but it's got all the other background notes too. The background? Yeah, it says the presenter view. It says the next slide. That's sort of thing okay. the notes that. How about now? Yeah, perfect, you got it. Perfect. Okay. So I think I didn't introduce myself formally, but I am Andrea Bischoff. I'm one of the pediatric colorectal surgeon at the International Center for Colorectal and Urogenital Care. So throughout this course today, you will see that over and over, we will uh, repeat the word spectrum. Whenever we think about anorectal malformation, we talk about spectrum. There are very benign malformations that are usually isolated and very complex anomalies that involve multiple systems. And when we think about prenatal diagnosis, more commonly, the severe ones are the ones that are diagnosed. And unfortunately, the reason why they diagnose, it's not because of the anus itself, it is because of the other associated anomalies, usually inside the abdomen. When they see multiple defects in a baby, that's when they suspect that this baby may have an anorectal malformation. The most commons are the bowel is a little dilated in utero. They can have tetracord. They can have vertebral anomaly. The kidneys may be dilated, hydronephrosis, or in patients with cloaca, they may have hydrocopos, the dilation of the vagina that Dr. Alanis showed. But if you are a patient or a parent and your child was born without the anus, you know that just by looking, you can make the diagnosis. So the reality is that just by looking in utero, they would also be able to make the diagnosis more often than what currently happens. But the problem is, at least in the United States, is not part of the anatomical prenatal screening to look at the anus. But most pregnant women, they want to know the gender of the baby. So it's not uncommon that the technician or the doctor spends a long time in the genitalia, trying to determine if the baby is a boy or is a girl. So if we just ask them to push that probe a little lower and look at the anus, most likely we will be diagnosing way more anorectal malformation than we currently do. So the anus can be seen prenatally, and that's the image that we see is that a little darker circle and a little bright image, that's the image of a normal anus. And if there is any doubt that the ultrasound is abnormal, they can order an MRI. And then in the MRI, for sure, they can see if the baby has the anus or not at any gestational age. And you may be wondering, but why is prenatal diagnosis important? And the reason is we have to change the stories. For my entire professional life, 
I hear the same stories from mothers over and over. They were expecting a baby. They were extremely happy that there was a baby coming. They did a few ultrasounds. They may have seen some abnormalities or may have not seen any abnormality. When the baby was born, for the first time in their lives, they heard the word imperforate anus. They didn't even know that this condition existed, and it was a shock. Depending on where the baby was born, the baby has to be transferred to another hospital. The father doesn't know if he stays with the mom, if he goes with the baby. They have to hand Parents have to hand their newborn to a surgeon that they have never met. They don't understand what's going to happen in the next few days. And what was supposed to be a very special moment becomes a roller coaster of traumatic emotions. So the reason why we believe it's important to make the prenatal diagnosis is just to prepare the families for what is coming prepare them for what's going to happen during the first 48 hours of life so they can plan where they want to deliver the baby and they know what's going to happen during the first two days of life. I always say there's no good moment to give unwanted news, uh, but at least you have time to prepare yourself, you have time to read about it, and actually enjoy the moment of the birth of your child. So that's why we truly believe that prenatal diagnosis is very important. And what all of you can do is if you see someone pregnant, tell them to make sure the anus is checked during the prenatal ultrasound, because in most places this is not done. And I'm sure all the mothers and fathers in the audience would appreciate how good it would have been if they knew ahead of time that it was coming. The other important reason why prenatal uh, diagnosis is important is because you can start making those connections that we also feel are extremely important meeting other patients that have been through that. So meeting, meeting another mother that was in a similar situations a few years before you. They can give you really good hope, good advices of what's gonna happen in the next few days. But once the baby is born, during the first 24 hours, it's very important to rule out all the associated anomalies. So as I just mentioned, in many patients with anorectal malformations, besides the anus, there are other organs that are also affected. And we have to make sure we check them all so we can properly address it before we put them under anesthesia. So about 30% of the patients have a cardiac condition only 10% of them will be hemodynamically important, meaning that the patient will need to be followed up by a cardiologist or will need a cardiac procedure. Kidneys, you just heard Dr. Wilcox talking how important it is. At least 50% of the patients will have problems in the kidney that can be from absent kidney, reflux, hydronephrosis, the dilation of the kidneys. We also want to look at the vertebra. Some patients may have scoliosis, is when the vertebra is a little curved. Some patients may have some absent bones. One that is very common is in the arms. They may have absent thumb. And very important for anorectal malformation, we want to know how is the sacrum? So the sacrum is where the nerves for the bowel and for the bladder come from. So every patient with anorectal malformation must have a sacral radiograph, AP and lateral. And with that, we can calculate the measurement. We can estimate if the patient has a good sacrum that will correlate together with the malformation, 
with the future prognosis for bowel control. And Dr. Alanis already mentioned, in females, we also want to know what is the Millerian anatomy? How are the uterus? How is the vagina? The ovaries are usually normal, but we want to inspect everything, especially in cloaca. We want to make sure that the vagina is not dilated during the newborn period. Then comes the question, what type of malformation my child has? And this is very important. You have to remember that your baby will not remember the early years. So you as a parent has to take notes and give this information for your child because later in life, they need to know what type of malformation they have so they can properly advocate for themselves when they have to go to the hospital without you next to them. So I'm gonna go over the different types of anorectal malformation. The most common one, the most benign one is called rectal perineal fistula. In this malformation, the rectum opens anterior to the center of the sphincter in males. It has a close relationship with the urethra. And in females, it also opens anterior to where it should be located right here. And even though in this drawing, it shows a big separation. Can you see my arrow or here? It shows a big separation from the vagina. In reality, it's very close. This is a rectal vestibular fistula. Sorry, it should be right here. This is a rectal perineal fistula. But the rectal vestibular fistula, the rectum opens in the vestibule of the vagina. In this case, it has a common wall with the vagina. This is the most common type of malformation in females. And for many years, it was erroneously called rectal vaginal fistula, just because in a baby, the genitalia is very small, and they would see stool coming very close to the vagina, so they thought it was a rectal vaginal fistula, but it's in reality a rectal vestibular fistula. Patients with the true imperforate anus, it's only this malformation in which the rectum is blind and there is no communication with the perineum, with the urinary tract, or with the vagina. So the rectum is completely blind. We called no fistula. For an unknown reason, this malformation is more frequently seen in patients with Down syndrome, with trisomy 21. We don't know why, but it's just an observation. The most common type of malformation in male patients is when the rectum communicates with the urethra. When it's very lower in the urethra, we call rectal urethral bulbar fistula. When it's in the middle of the urethra, we call rectal urethral prostatic fistula. And when it's very higher up, we call rectal bladder neck fistula. This is the only malformation in male patients in which the separation of the rectum from the urinary tract should happen through the abdomen. The other ones we can do all posterior sagittally. And in females, instead of being born with a one with three holes in the perineum, the urethra to pee, the vagina, and the anus. Some girls are born with a single perineal orifice, and that's called cloaca. And then they will have a common channel that will divide into bladder, vagina, and rectum. And the length of this common channel may vary from short common channel when it's less than three centimeters and it correlates with better prognosis to long common channel that require more complex surgery. And the most complex type of anorectal malformation, it's called cloacal extrophy. In this anomaly, there is a defect in the abdominal wall. So the patient is born with an omphalocele on the top. It's a membrane that covers bowel, two hemibladders, 
and a piece of bowel in between both hemibladders. So after birth, there are two scenarios. The most common scenarios is that the patient will undergo a colostomy, then a posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, and then the colostomy closure. And the second scenario, especially for patients with rectoperineal fistula and rectovestibular fistula, is that the patient will go a posterior sagittal approach without a colostomy. But what everybody will have is the scary moment uh, of anal dilations, diaper rash, and constipation. That's what we are going to be dealing with after the operation. Regarding anal dilations, I always tell the parents of my patient that when the operation is done correctly, the anal dilation is just avoiding the natural healing process from making the anus smaller. They should not be painful. And most parents, they are very scary, very concerned when they start, and then they agree that it was not what they thought was going to be. The diaper rash happens especially in patients after we close the colostomy. For the first two weeks, the baby is passing a lot of stool, and we want to make sure we address that properly because it can be very painful. And then from the time of colostomy closure until the age of toilet training, we want to make sure the patient is not developing constipation because we don't want that colon to dilate, dilate, dilate and lose the capacity to contract. So from the age that we close the colostomy until the age of toilet training, we are trying to establish regularity. We want to avoid diaper rash and avoid constipation. And the other portion that it's very important is explaining and adjusting the expectations of the parents so they know what to expect. Will my child most likely have bowel control or will my child most likely suffer from fecal incontinence? Again, there's no good time to share, not so good news. But the importance of being honest with parents is putting them in a good path and treating it accordingly. So even when I tell a family that your child will not have bowel control, I can share the good news that I know how to offer bowel management with the animus. That's something we're going to talk later today. And your child will be completely clean in the underwear for stool. So in the big picture of life, fecal incontinence, when it's managed and treated correctly, will not hold the child back. They can do everything they want. So based on the type of malformation and the quality of the sacrum and having a technically correct operation, we can tell what are the chances for bowel control? And at birth, it's important to remember that everybody's fecal incontinence, so all kids will be in diapers in the early years of life. But we want our patients to be out of diapers at the same age that children around them are out of diapers. So if we don't succeed in toilet training, we will start bowel management with enemas, even if it's on temporary basis. But we want our patients to be out of diapers at the same age that other kids around them are out of diapers. So I think that's what I had for you. And I'll be happy to answer a few questions that you may have. Let me see if there are any questions. Those are just for Dr. Wilcox. So
So there is one question, I think this was for Dr. Wilcox still, but I'm going to answer. How would you manage a patient who had laparoscopically assisted rectal prosthetic fistula repaired and has a remanent fistula communicating with the urethra? So we call that posterior urethral diverticulum. Is when the surgeon cuts the rectum and leave a piece of of the rectum attached to the urethra. So if it is symptomatic and big, this patient needs a reoperation. So we like to approach it posterior sagittally. Um, what are the chances of bowel control in a cloaca patient greater than three centimeters? It depends on how is the sacrum uh, and what is greater than three centimeters. But generally speaking, 80% of the patients will not have bowel control. When, when you have a common channel more than three centimeters, the majority of the patients will need bowel management with enemas. I, let me see if there is any other questions or if I answered them all here. Okay. How to prevent constipation without laxatives? That's a very good question. Most of the patients with anorectal malformation, they have a constipation so severe that only with diet is very difficult to manage. Most of our patients require laxatives and our preference is Senna. Dr. De La Torre will be talking about the management of constipation. Now, in terms of diet, what can we do to help them? For babies, when they breast milk is excellent, makes them poop very good. But once it's time to start cereal, for example, we have oatmeal and rice cereal. So rice will be very constipating. You will prefer oatmeal. In terms of the fruits, we would prefer the fruits with pea. So peach, pear, prune is very good. Uh, papaya is very good. And I say the perfect avocado because avocado doesn't start with a pea, but it's very good for pooping also. And the, the fruits that will constipate, the food that will constipate is banana, white bread, white pasta. But again, it's very hard to manage constipation with diet only. Uh, bowel management with enema, is it painful for the kid? It is not painful. Enemas do not hurt. And once the kid perceives the benefit of it, most of them tolerate without problems. How long are the anal dilations after PSARP? We have a protocol. So in the beginning of the protocol, when you are increasing the size of the Hager dilators, you're doing every day, twice a day, one minute in the morning, one minute in the evening. And then once you reach the ideal Hager size according to the age, then we are gonna start tapering, decreasing the frequency. And at the end of the protocol, you're doing once a month. So you have to put in your calendar to remember. But the entire process may take between six months to eight months. And then we stop completely. Is the enema for lifetime or temporary? It depends. For some patients, it may be the treatment for life. For other patients that have borderline bowel control, it may be temporary. So we start them on enemas, and then every year during a summer break, we give them a chance to see if they have bowel control or not, stopping the enemas. Uh, explain Senna dosage. So Dr. De La Torre will be talking about constipation later today. For children with Down syndrome, no fistula, three years old, Okay, so if the patient is not clean, we would recommend it's time to start enemas. We want our patients to be clean. Use of anal dilator, use of anal dilator mostly ends up with tight anal stricture. Yes, that stricture happens because of 
other reasons, because the surgery, the blood supply was not good or tension in your anoplasty. Anal dilations are not to dilate real stricture. Anal dilations are just to avoid the natural healing process to not narrow the anus. Um, does dilation twice a day should last three seconds or one whole minute? We do 30 seconds, take it out, 30 seconds, take it out. So it's one minute in the morning, one minute in the evening. Does the enema cause any side effect? We have seen very, very few patients that came back to us with a narrow left colon. We don't know if this is caused by the enema or not, but those are very few patients. So other than that, we don't know of negative side effects. Okay, I think I answered all the questions. What is the general size of the last Hager rod by a one-year baby? Okay, a one. so a newborn should be a number 12. At four months should be a number 13. At eight months should be a number 14. I think I answer all the questions. One more. What to do if diaper rash continues even after one or 1.5 years of the pull through surgery? Well, I think you have to. This will require a full evaluation, uh, but that's when we may start formal bowel management to treat the diaper rash. So it depends. You can have diaper rash in a patient that is suffering from constipation, or you can have diaper rash in a patient suffering from diarrhea. So your doctor will have to find out what's the problem of the baby in order to offer a good treatment. So I think I answered all the questions. It's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Pena, who will be sharing um, the questions that parents must ask and the importance of a technically correct operation. You all know Dr. Pena. Dr. Pena is the person, the surgeon who created the surgery to repair patients born with anorectal malformation. So make sure you pay attention and ask him all the questions that you may have. You can share your screen, Dr. Pena. Can you see that? Uh, not Hello? yet. Can, not can, yet, no. Andrea, can you see that? No, we cannot see the screen. So that, that what, what would be the reason? You have to share screen. Click on share screen. Share screen. In the Zoom. Wait. wait. I'm going to get back. Um, share screen. Now you have to show the PowerPoint because we are seeing... The PowerPoint disappear here. Okay. It, so what you want to do is uh, go back and open the PowerPoint on your computer and then come back here and then share screen. And the PowerPoint will be the, the first thing you see. So I'll continue answering questions. Dr. Pena, you want to stop sharing screen? open the PowerPoint and then share screen again. So a very good question. Are children with anorectal malformation more likely to have colon cancer? As of today, no. We don't have any reason to suspect that. But we want patients with anorectal malformation to follow the regular cancer screening as the general population. That's why Dr. Alanis mentioned girls should have their pap smears. And every patient at 45 years of age should start doing their colonoscopy. Now, if they have family history, that's a different scenario. They would have to start their colonoscopy sooner. 
But if no family history at 45 is when you have to do your first um, colonoscopy. So we're going to give everybody a five minutes bathroom break, and then we'll work with Dr. Pena just to get his presentation. Hello, Andre. How's he doing? <laughs> no, I don't have a phone number for him, so. <laughs> okay. Okay.
Perfect. It looks wonderful. Okay, we are ready to start. One second. Okay. Well, we're we're back, and um, Dr. Pena, you can start. Uh, please unmute yourself first, though, sir. Oh, unmute, unmute. There we go. Perfect. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning for us in Denver, Colorado. Perhaps it's afternoon in other places, or it's even night in other continents. It's my pleasure to talk again to all the participants. And I hope that at this time we have many parents of children that were born with colorectal malformations or urogenital malformations. <clears throat> the, this talk is dedicated to the mainly to the mothers of patients with anorectal malformation. With all due respect to the to the fathers, the fathers are also loving individuals, very concerned about children. But the passion and the love and dedication of the mothers has no parallel. They, through my entire career, I have been deeply impressed by the by the courage and the love and the character of the mothers. What the mothers can do for in to protect the children impressed me so much through my life. I can tell you many stories. When when I was living in New York, the mothers who escaped from the Soviet Union at the time of the Iron Cur Curtain, and it, they, it took sometimes one or two years for them to travel all the way to New York and show up in my office and said, here I am, take care of my son, or, or mothers that escaped from Cuba to God, and, in, and they... Um, they were able to do incredible things to protect their children. So my respects and admiration to all the mothers that can that are, that are now listening to me. So a baby is born. This is um, you will agree with me that this is one of the most important events of our lives, beginning with our own uh, birth, and then uh, with. Um, with the birth of our children, our grandchildren. And uh, for when a baby is born, it comes with um, a lot of expectations from the parents, the young parents who have been dreaming about seeing the baby and looking forward to have a healthy little human being and watch him growing and developing to become a healthy individual and, and a productive citizen. The grandparents are also waiting Everybody, they, the parents uh, have been guessing about what name are they going to give to the baby. They have great, great expectations. And then suddenly, a doctor walks into the room of the mother and tells the bad news. Your child has a congenital malformation. That's a, that's a real, that produces a shock, actually. And uh, I watch many parents, the reaction of many parents, and I have I I observe that usually the the uh, reaction from the parents goes in different stages. First is shock, a shock. They cry. They uh, they are very upset, and then confusion. What are we going to do? Who can help us? What kind of malformation? What's going to happen to my baby? And they don't have a specific person to 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 ask for for help, and um, and they don't know anything about congenital malformations. And then and then the next step stage is that frequently they get very very angry. They get why me? Why did it happen to me? What did I do wrong? What uh, this is not fair. I have been working my decent, I'm honest, I work hard, I love, I love my children, I love my parents, I'm a good citizen, why this happens to me? And for those who are religious, they have a big, big question. Why God, supposedly so benign, why do you send me this? 
and they are very upset and frequently they need the help of a religious person and they need the help, support from psychologists, psychiatrists, the grandparents to tell them you didn't do any wrong, anything wrong. This is things that happen in life. Usually it's a couple that plan everything in advance. They went through high school, college, professional studies, uh, postgraduate studies. They planned their marriage. They have been working. They plan everything. They had an excellent prenatal care. And pow, comes the malformation. That's a real drama. And then after, after some time, the angerness starts decreasing. And then the, the parents start accepting the fact that the baby has a congenital malformation. And as time goes by, the baby starts developing his own personality. In other words, this baby starts smiling and the parents develop a rapport with the little baby and they love him. And so finally they accept that they have that baby and they love him the same, even more than that a normal child. And after that comes a, a very interesting stage in, this, in the parents of children with congenital malformation. <clears throat> And that is the stage of meaning and inspiration. Then, then when they are relaxed, when they are calm, when they are not angry, they start thinking, why do I get this? What's the meaning? For those who are religious, they said, why God sent me this? Must be some meaning. Must be something good behind this. Perhaps the baby came, for instance, when the parents have been always privileged from the day they were born, and they they are very successful in life, and suddenly this happens, they start thinking perhaps is that God wanted us to see what real life is, so so we can become more humble, so we can understand those in tragedy, those in disgrace, and they start thinking about that, and then they become inspired. We should be those. We we should do something uh, on behalf of this baby, uh, because there is a meaning about why he was born like this, and and then you can see many many parents who happen to be uh, to have economical resources. They are very successful, and they decide to create organizations, foundations to help all the children born with similar malformation. So um, a baby is born with this malformation, and, and because of that, a big foundation is created, and hundreds of children are benefit because of him. So the parents find a meaning in the in the in the fact that they have a baby with a malformation, and uh, sometimes it happens early in life of the baby. Usually, this happens when the child is already older, and then the parents want to do something and want to do something because they remember the the pain and the suffering that they went through and they want to help others. And that's also when the mothers created, and it was an idea of the mothers who created organizations of parents of children with anorectal malformations, organizations in the United States that is called Put Through Network, in Italy that is called AMAR, in Germany, in many other countries, they are the mothers of leaders who come together and they want to try to help all the mothers of children with anorectal malformation. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we could create a kind of a red phone? That's when in the stage of shock, when the baby is born and the, in the stage of confusion, the parents could dial a number and a voice in the other side answer and say, how are you? I'm, I'm, how can I help you? He said, don't panic. I, <clears throat> I personally went through the same experience that you are having. I will be happy to help you and guide you as to what to do. Because then come the, in, the, in the newborn stage, the parents have to decide what to do with the baby. Sometimes the baby is born in a famous academic institution with all the necessary medical and surgical resources, and receives a good treatment. But sometimes the baby is born in a little hospital, non-academic hospital, where there are some surgeons with very little experience in these malformations. But they don't know. They don't know how much experience those uh, surgeons have. 
They don't know wh whether to take the baby to another place, whether to accept what the local surgeon says. They are confused. They need orientation. And that's where it's, it's so important. Organizations like Pull Through Network to help parents. As we are talking right now, in many places in the world, there is a newborn baby with anorectal malformation, and the parents are totally confused. And, and those who have experienced and went through this will be happy to help them. So I encourage all the, the parents that are listening to this to contribute <clears throat> with those organizations of parents of children with these malformations. I'm going to, first of all, Another thing that is important for you to know is that we are dealing with anorectal malformations that are frequently associated to uro urologic conditions, specifically sexual organs malform also. So that means that that makes this malformation a kind of a secret malformation. People don't like to talk about this because is that, is that it's shameful to have defects in the genitalia. Uh, and they, these malformations are not well known in the community because they are related with stool, they are related with urine and with sexual organs, which are taboo in the conversation of parents. You are traveling in a bus or in an airplane and you talk to the neighbor passenger and you tell him that your baby was sick, that had appendicitis. But then you took him to a hospital and they did a laparoscopic procedure and a minimal orifice in the abdomen and the baby recovered very well, to a wonderful wah, wah, wah. And then the other passenger will tell you that this baby son had a cardiac condition that was successfully operated. They are very proud. If your baby has a sexual malformation or uh, on the sexual organs or anorectal malformation, people don't share much of that information. They don't feel comfortable sharing that. As a consequence, most human beings don't know about these malformations. Everybody knows about cardiac conditions. Everybody knows about cancer. Everybody knows about uh, um, um, viral infections, but they don't know about anorectal malformations. That's a problem, see? And then um, I'm going to describe the, the, what I call the Zaga, of the families of children born with anorectal malformations. The baby is born, and then the surgeon comes to the room of the mother and says, your baby has no anus, but don't worry. We are going to do a colostomy, and, and after that, we are going to do an operation to repair the malformation, and your baby is going to be okay. And the question is, what okay means? They, they don't give the entire information about what's the problem in the baby. So the parents accept that, they go through the colostomy. Sometimes the colostomy is done perfectly well. Sometimes they have complications with the colostomy, unexpected complications. And finally, and then for the mother see a, a lovely baby with a, with a piece of bowel exposed in the abdomen, and they have to deal with them with that. They really feel terrible to see the baby like that. But very soon they learn to manage the colostomy and some of the mothers are ad admirable because they have an excellent care of the stoma. And then they go for the final repair and the baby recovers from the operation and then they close the colostomy and the mother is very happy because now they are done, okay? But then the, the, the baby reaches the age of two and the, the mothers don't know much about medicine and about bowel control but they have something very important, which is common sense. And they have something more important that is an authentic, sincere interest in the benefit of the baby because they love the baby. So they watch the baby and they see something, something kind of unusual. There's some, my, they see the baby walking around and this, the poop coming out of the anus and the baby doesn't make any faces indicating that he feels that something is happening. And from previous children, the mothers learn that the patients, the patients, even when they don't know how to verbalize that they want to go to the toilet, 
they go to, to some corner in the house and they start pushing, indicating that they are having, they feeling and they are having a bowel movement. But the baby is not doing that. So she's worried. And then she goes to the pediatrician and the pediatrician says, well, um, let's change the diet. Let's give a little bit of a fiber. Let's do this, let's do that. And nothing, nothing improves. And the baby is already get, getting to three years of age. By the age of three, most children are totally totally trained. And this baby is almost three and is not totally trained. Then the pediatrician says, why don't we send the baby to the pediatric surgeon? Goes to the pediatric surgeon. Pediatric surgeon puts his big finger in the anus and says, well, my operation is perfect. So uh, let's, uh, uh, why don't we send the baby to the gastroenterologist? So they send to the gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist does a rectal manometry, which is useless by the way. The rectal manometry doesn't help, doesn't help you, doesn't give you information to do something positive for the baby, but they do that anyway. And then the gastroenterologist sometimes may uh, suggest to do something called biofeedback a kind of a training for the baby to, to contract the muscles and so forth, but nothing improves. Biofeedback doesn't improve the baby. And biofeedback may have some mild benefit in patients that are almost totally trained, but in general doesn't help. And then the mother is, they start the via crucis. Then they start with a, a child that is now three years old, four years old, has to send the baby to school, and in school, they don't accept the baby with diapers. So then the mother has to go to a special school with a bunch of diapers, talk to the director of the school, talk to the nurse of the school to change the diaper at school. So And the baby starts realizing that he's different and starts suffering from um, symptoms of withdrawal, shyness. He feels, he's, he feels rejected. All the children make fun of him and start the psychological sequela. And that, that and, 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 and the mother starts going from one institution to another institution. After recommendations, they go and they suggest some things. And when they, we see patients that come to us when they are 10 years old, fecally incontinent. And then we start by studying the patient. Starting because the patient has a sacrum. As you know, the, the presence of the sacrum means, a normal sacrum means, in general, good bowel control. Certainly, the presence of a normal sacrum contributes to have a normal bowel and urinary control. Not 100%, but it helps. So that's the first question. How is the sacrum in your son? And the mother says, sacrum? Never heard of that. So the mother never was never told that the baby was born with no sacrum. If um, So this is a very important for all the parents that are listening. At present time, based on a 40-year experience in more than 4,000 patients operated by us, now we are able to, during the five, first three or five days of life of the baby, to determine the future pro functional prognosis of the baby. We can tell the parents what's going to happen with the baby to avoid this that I call the saga of these families. It's very painful when we see that the baby has a very poor sacrum, but it's very painful, but it's less painful than let the family go through this saga. As when we, we tell them your baby will not have bowel control in his life, as far as we can, as we can say now. But we cannot make him continent, but we can we can commit ourselves and be, be uh, we will guarantee that we will keep your baby your child completely clean of stool and urine in the underwear. So artificially clean with something called bowel management, and sometimes in the urine with urinary catheter, catheterization. So um, we have to. The, all the parents with un, the children with unrectal malformation must know. But let me see. Must know that that unrectal malformations, like all uh, uh, biological phenomenon, 
presents in a form of a spectrum. As you can see, what, like the colors of the rainbow. And in one side of the spectrum are the mar formations that, are, that have good functional prognosis. These mar formations in this group are mar formations that when the baby receives a technically correct operation, the baby is going to behave like a normal child or almost normal child. But then in the other side of the spectrum are mar formations that are very bad, have very bad pro functional prognosis. Sometimes it's because they have they were born with no sphincters, they have they have a very bad sacrum, they have tethe cord, they have myelomeningocele, or a combination of all these, which results in very bad prognosis. We can tell where your baby is in a spectrum in the first few days of life. And a doctor that knows the subject of color anoretta malformation is morally obligated to determine the future prognosis of the baby in the first few days of life. We have all the necessary equipment and, and, uh, and material to, to determine this in the first few. And then, it's, as I said, it's painful to tell the parent the bad news, but it's, it's better than let them suffer with a hope, with, a, with a false expectations, and spend a lot of money and be subjected to false uh, treatments that are not beneficial for the child and spend a uh, lot of effort. So uh, this is the, the mother should ask when a baby is born with unrectal malformation, where is my baby in this spectrum? What should I expect? And, uh, and, uh, and adjusting the expectation from day day one, we are convinced that it's much better than let the parents suffer. In this X-ray film, you see this is the pelvis of a baby and the sacrum is this last part of the spine. You know, the spine keeps going like that. And the, and the last the last five vertebra of the spine, the, the, uh, the, the, the tip of the spine near the anus, is, this is the sacrum. This last part, we call it coccyx, and this is the sacrum. This is a normal sacrum. And it's the first study that we order in a baby born with an erectile malformation. In this, in this film here, you see that this sacrum is different from this. There is a defect here in the sacrum. And this defect usually is associated to a mass, a tumor, a benign tumor there. And the presence of this tumor and this defect of sacrum changes completely the prognosis of the baby. This baby doesn't have the same good prognosis as this one. And in this particular one, the babies, all this part of the sacrum is missing completely. So the, he only has two vertebrae. So this equivalent to an absent sacrum, this patient would never have bowel control and would never have urinary control. But again, doesn't mean that we abandon the patients. So going back to the, to the spectrum, we have learned after the treatment of so many patients that at least 25% of all our patients, 25% will never have bowel control. They belong to this group. And then after a few years practicing in managing these patients, we, we ask ourselves, what, what can we do about this, those children? Should we send them to the pediatricians, back to the pediatrician, back to the gastroenterologist? Because we do operation and that's, a, that's the end of my responsibility. Many surgeons like to do that. They just like to operate and they don't go for the long-term follow-up of the patients, which I consider is morally unacceptable. If some surgeon wants to operate on children with unrectal malformations and perhaps all other malformations, he is morally obligated to follow the patients to the last consequences. The long-term follow-up of our patients in pediatric surgery is extremely important for us and for the children. And, and we, should, we should follow our patients for several reasons. Number one, when we, when, when we have the privilege of operating patients with good prognosis, those patients keep growing and they keep, they keep sending messages to us. I have a bunch of hundreds of letters from my patients that now they are adults and they, they send me pictures when they graduate, when they get married, 
when they had, and it's a great, great satisfaction. There is nothing more like, like that for pediatric surgeons. You know, the artists, the great singers, the opera singers, and the great uh, singers and dancers, they get their motivation from the applause of the, of the public. And we get, we pediatric surgeons get our motivation from those manifestations of gratefulness from our, our, our patients. So th therefore, I suggest all the pediatric surgeons that are listening, follow your patients, not only with anorectal malformation, follow your patients with any malformation until as much until you die, and you will get many satisfactions. But as I mentioned yesterday, if we made mistakes, we have patients with complications, and, and we should follow them and watching them. We are responsible for what we did. We're supposed to try to help them. And they, I, they keep reminding us that we must be extremely delicate, meticulous, and careful when dealing with little babies. So the, the, um, that's why, and I insist, if a pediatric surgeon likes to operate on rectal malformations, you are committed, you are morally obligated to deal with these patients and these complications and sequela. Even patients with good prognosis, sometimes they have constipation. But you have to take care of that because the type of constipation that our patients suffer from is not the same as the constipation that pediatricians take care of. The, the common child with constipation alleviates usually with a, with a change of diet and a minor amount of laxative. Our patients with iron rectal malformations have severe constipation that requires a knowledge about the management of these of these patients. So, in, as you know, patients with iron rectal malformations are born with associated defect. At least ten percent of them have at least ten percent have cardiac conditions that require some sort of treatment. Thirty percent of them at birth have some some form of cardiac condition, but only 10% of them have a need treatment, you know, serious malformation. 30% of them have a sacral defect, which is crucial for the prognosis, as I explained. Also, also they may have abnormal spine, uh, spine. So that's why we need an orthopedic surgeon. So uh, ideally, a, a patient born with anorectal malformations needs the, uh, the assistance of a cardiologist, um, an orthopedic surgeon, a urologist, a gynecologist in a female, and other specialties, nephrologists because of the kidney. So in the spine, you know, we have the vertebra in the spine, and sometimes they have half vertebras with something called hemivertebra, and a hemivertebra produces scoliosis, a deviation like that. And that patient must be seen early in life by an orthopedic surgeon, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and be followed and managed like, like that to avoid that the problem gets worse as time goes by. The same happens with the patients who have a urologic condition like hypospadias or kidney problems. Must be a pediatric urologist, pediatric urologist with experience in anorectal malformation. And then in, in the patients, female patients that are born with double vagina or with a, um, with absent vagina or the cloaca, they need, when they grow up, they need, they will need a gynecologist. And uh, so this all means that the patients with anorectal malformations must be treated by a team of specialized doctors, a team of specialized doctors. So if the baby was born in a sm small community in the middle of nowhere, then the parent must consider seriously move to a place where they have one of these uh, teams dedicated to the treatment of this. And that's how um, in the year 2005 uh, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we created the first colorectal center for children, for children in, in Cincinnati. So the there is no question that the babies will benefit in, uh, for the treatment in a place where it's a group of people dedicated to this not, and, and something else. The, this team is going to follow the patient. 
if the parents don't have to be concerned, they are going to the hospital, they are going to see the same faces, they are going, they, they know the child by the first name, and they will follow the patient with care and love. In the colorectal center, in addition to these specialized people, there must be a social worker, there must be a psychologist, and um, and so to help the, the, the family as a whole and, and continue the follow-up. So um, we created the first colorectal center in Cincinnati. There Now there are several colorectal centers in the country and in other countries also, particularly in Mexico, has at least three colorectal centers, very good colorectal centers, and in other countries too. So the parents should ask for, the, the, for this. And pediatric surgeons who like to take care of these patients should fight and work hard to try to integrate centers like this are extremely beneficial. So the um, the um, this the this patient the patient with anorectal malformations require a repair, but the repair of these malformations is a very delicate, meticulous repair. So that means that the, this patient must be operated ideally by specialized surgeons. To uh, the fact that a surgeon is, is a is a um, graduated as a pediatric surgeon, is a board-certified pediatric surgeon, doesn't mean that he has enough experience to take care of these patients. I'm going to repeat this, that is politically incorrect. But the fact that the surgeon is certified, board-certified as a pediatric surgeon, doesn't mean that he's necessarily is capable of repairing these malformations with the degree of expertise that we that we would like to have if we were dealing with our own son or our own daughter. So, um, so in addition, um, a surgeon may be working in a center, but doesn't have in the number of the, the number of cases necessary to develop experience. This surgery, technical surgery requires repetition and repetition. This is like playing the piano, except that it's more complex than that because it's like playing the piano, but you are playing a, a different piano every day you play. So that uh, uh, requires more and more cases because even when the malformations can be in general classified, every case has a little difference. It's just anatomic variations. And experience means that you are familiar with the many anatomic variations, and you learn how to deal with each one of those variations, and you end up doing a good operation. It is scientifically demonstrated that centers that have a great number of cases have much better results than those who have do very few cases. If you take the number of cases of anorectal malformations born in the United States, per year, and divided by the number of practicing pediatric surgeons in the United States, then it comes that to, to a uh, very bad number. It means that every surgeon is one of doing about one or two cases per year. Of course, this is just general. In reality, there are many pediatric surgeons that have great experience and are doing much, but there are other surgeons that they don't even have one case per year. So, but the average would be one or two cases per year and per surgeon. That means that the parent must be very selective when they decide, when they, they are going to decide where to take the child to receive treatment for these malformations. And that, uh, for, and they have the right to ask, uh, to ask questions, you know. And these are uncomfortable questions, you know. The parents go to, and, to a hospital and say, Excuse me, with all due respect, doctor, can you tell me how number of how, how many cases per year do you operate in cases like my son or my daughter? And they are going to be un, uncomfortable with that kind of question. And how many cases are in this hospital per year? And how many surgeons are here that operate on these children? All of them are operating this. And then is there a team here 
Is there a team, a call rector center? And are you committed to, to the follow-up of my son for life? And then do you have bowel management? Bowel management, as, a, as I told you, when we confronted the, the idea that at least 25% of our patients were, were going to be, will be totally incontinent, we decided that we cannot abandon them and we created the bowel management program that now, fortunately, other institutions are doing. That's great. And the bowel management is something simple and it's medical, it's not surgical. And therefore, many surgeons don't like to do it. Surgeons like to operate. They don't like to do bowel management. So, but you should look for a surgeon committed to do bowel management because it is, may take his time and he prefers to be in the operating room rather than supervising a bowel management. But the bowel management has, has been the, had the most dramatic effect in patients with fecal incontinence. Dramatically changes the quality of life of children that have no bowel control. Fecal incontinence is a, is a terrible problem. So some of the parents that are listening to me know more than me how bad is that. The patients develop serious psychological problems, have serious problems becoming socializing with, with all the children. And they have serious problems in, in establishing a relationship with the opposite gender, giving a, girl, a girlfriend and getting married. So they suffer from depression. They have problems adapting to the, to the job. And they sometimes they are not accepted in the, in the work. And sometimes they commit suicide, very sad. So the bowel management dramatically changed that. The, 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 the mother is committed to give an enema, made to take one hour of her entire day. And during that hour, the baby will empty the colon and guarantee for the following 24 hours is going to be completely clean. So think uh, active, doing, doing whatever activity corresponds to his age, being so social with other children and so forth. So I think the bowel management is a real contribution for the management of these, of these patients. Um, so the, uh, um, but the bowel management takes some time, takes time for the, uh, for the mother. And, uh, and then when the child is old enough, he has to learn to, to, to give enemas himself, not, not, not only the mother. It is possible to do it, they learn to do it, and it's something very private. And when the children go to school, to college, we follow them and we send letters to the, to the college indicating that the child needs a room because he's for the private issues of the bowel management. So we are convinced that it's extremely beneficial. And something more important, in, in so-called developing countries, many times we surgeons say, well, we don't do MRIs because we don't have money, it's very expensive. We don't do um, ECMO because there is no money. That's true. But with bowel management, there is no excuse. Bowel management is cheap, very cheap. But it needs time and dedication and love for these children. So, um, then another another something something very important that happens in anorectal malformations is that when the baby is born and the, the families, the family of the father and the family of the mother listen about congenital malformation, they say, where does that come from? And there are social prejudices sometimes. And if they say the, the family of the mother says, well, in my family that, that never happened. So that's something that must come from the father. And the father's side, they say, well, in our family, we don't have that much comfort. And they start having, in addition to the pain and the suffering of the parents, now they have these, these uh, negative uh, thoughts about the origin of the malformation. So that's, that's very, very bad. And it's very important for the parents to know that there's, there's nothing that comes from one family or the other they must avoid completely that kind of discussion. When they, when the parents of children with anorectal malformation go to a geneticist, 
and they ask, is this hereditary? Is this genetically determined? Most of the geneticists, based on book text, textbooks, they, they look and they say, well, it's about 1% chances to have another child like this. In other words, um, the parents are suffering because of the child of this malformation, but then they, they, they have to decide, are we going to have another child? Should we have another child? What are the chances for us to have another child like this? And the geneticist would say 1%. But it's beautiful for us, the fact that we have a database with, with thousands of cases. Because when with the database, we can answer many important questions. And one question is this about genetics. Well, it turns out that if you take all the cases together, yes, in about 1% of the cases, this happens again in the same family. 1% we think is very small, and that's why we always recommend the families to have another child, to compensate with the pain and suffering of the first child. But then if you look at uh, different types of malformations, then you find that that 1% is not it's not true for all malformation. It's true in general, but it turns out that babies that have uh, uh, something called pre-sacral mass, at the begin beginning of my talk, I show you some X-ray theme of a sacrum with a defect that has, has a, a pre-sacral mass, a, a tumor. That particular malformation is, has, a, is, has a tendency to be familiar. When we see one of those children, I'm going to, I'm going to show you this, this is malformation. When the baby is born like this, we are, we immediately screen all the members of the family, the father, the mother, and the brother, siblings, and we find that very frequently they have a defect like this, smaller perhaps, with or without an rectal malformation. But this is, is, is the same kind of defect. So this the if you if a child has was born with anorectal malformation and this defect, the chances to have the family, same family, to have another child with this are very high, very high. And that's why we recommend not to have another child. Or it's up to the family. But this is so the one percent, again I'm going to repeat, the one percent is for the entire group of anorectal malformation. But actually, this is much higher in this particular malformation and much less in the other. In cloacas, for instance, we have never seen, we never seen, um, sorry, we have never seen two cloacas in the same family. So we believe that the chances to have a second cloaca is even inexistent or is minimal. So again, remember 1% for the entire group, but different percentages depending on the malformation. And um, so congratulations for those parents that belong to our organizations to help others. It's extremely valuable, extremely valuable. In, in the experience in Italy, um, um, a lady by the name of Dalia Aminov, the president of the Italian Association, went through a lot of, a lot of troubles and uh, because the she even went to the, because most of the hospitals are government hospitals in Italy, and she demanded that the hospital answer all the questions of the parents, that is specifically answer how many cases of unrectal malformations they have per year, and how many surgeons are there. So, so the parents can make um, um, intelligent decisions about where to, to take care of the children. So the, um, those countries that have no, that they don't have organizations, organize them yourselves to to demand, to demand from the governments of them to to create colorectal centers for children, and with dedicated people. And uh, for instance, in England, with one specific malformation called biliary atresia, the government already decided that all biliary atresia cases in the country should be sent to one specific institution. And that's where they guarantee the best possible care for those patients. 
So the same thing can be done for colorectal problem. It, it, granted that it's not easy to do that in the United States because the, the government, the because we have a, a um, the majority of the medical in organizations and, and institutions and academic institutions are private. But in those countries that have a, a socialized medicine, they can do that. But in the in United States, we can start doing something like that, have more pressure for the institutions to refer these cases to, to sophisticated centers with enough experience. So congratulations to those parents that are putting their time and dedication to create this organization. And what's coming in the future for patients with anorectal malformation? I will not be there, but you, the young parents that are listening and the young pediatric surgeons will be seeing something like that. Number one, it is an irony. Um, is the, I call that the, the sense of, the God sense of humor. So the rich countries in the, in the world those countries more advanced, like Germany, Sweden, old Scandinavia, and, um, and England, and so forth, then they have resources to operate on these patients, but they have very few patients because of the birth rate is decreasing and parents don't want to have more children. So then they, they have, the surgeons have very little experience with this. So there is more need to centralize these cases in those countries because, because if everybody wants to operate anorectal malformation, they will never have enough experience. And as I said, ironically, poor countries that sometimes don't have enough material, equipment, money, resources to operate on these patients, they have many, many cases. So we pediatric surgeons should be wise and create a system in which these pediatric surgeons from so-called developed countries with resources but very little money could go to the countries with little resources with many patients to, to learn about the management of these cases and, uh, and, and provide some material equipment and economical help to the countries that have so many. You have been in, in countries where we were invited to operate and they take us to a floor and they say, Dr. Peña, here are 42 cases with anorectal malformations. You select which ones, you, which ones do you want to operate? 42 cases. You can take, operate as many as you want, they say. In other countries, they have an institution with one case per year. So there's a, there's a, that's an irony. That's it. So when, now for the future, what I, what I dream about, what I would like very much, is to create a system to achieve better training of pediatric surgeons to avoid preventable complications. Training programs, those places that claim that they can train pediatric surgeons, they have to declare how many cases of unrectal malformations have in two years, because the training program in pediatric surgery is two years. And then based on that number, they have to ask themselves, can we reasonable, safe, can train a young man to deal with this spectrum of these malformations with that number of cases? If we don't have the enough number of cases, we should not be a training center. So that's very, very important. So that's a, a big question that all institutions in uh, no, all countries in the world should be asking that when they announce themselves, advertise themselves as training programs, do they have enough cases to be able to train a, a young pediatric surgeon in giving him a level of expertise necessary to operate on these patients without damaging them? And then we should struggle to create more and more bowel management centers because bowel management is the non-elegant part. But if you want to do operate anorectal malformations, you are obligated to provide bowel management to the patients to take care of your own sequela and complications. And the prenatal diagnosis is getting better every year and we'll be able 
soon to make that diagnosis early enough so the parents can make decisions about having a baby or interrupting a pregnancy, depending on the severity of the malformation and the ideology of the parents. Genetics also something that I'm not going to see, but it's going to tell us a lot about anorectal malformations. The major, the great majority are not, don't seem to be related to genetic uh, disorders. Might must be something that is called multifactorial which means we don't know why some patients are born like that. And of course, research is the, we expect great things for research. So we can uh, try to avoid these malformations at all or, or have better treatments for these patients. And finally, a few words about something called transition of care. Our patients keep growing and they become adults. A girl that was born with a cloaca becomes a young lady and goes to the gynecologist and says, doctor, I was born with a cloaca. And he gets in shock when he, when she hears that the answer of the gynecologist is, says, what is that? I'm sorry, I never heard of that. So, so and that happens also with, with colorect, adult colorectal surgeons and adult urologists when they deal with this, some of the sequela of our patients. So therefore we are, we are, we are doing our best to create an association with our adult colleagues. Children's Hospital Colorado is located next to the university hospital. And we have an excellent relationship with our adult colleagues who, so we sometimes we invite them to come to the, to the, our institution to learn a little bit about the problems that we deal with that will become their problem when these patients grow up. So that's called transition of care. In fact, Dan, Dr. Dan Wood, that will be talking after this, is a pediatric urologist and adult urologist that has one foot in the university hospital and another at children's hospital, consistent with the idea of transition of care. So with this, I, I uh, want to thank you very much for your attention. I will be very happy to answer questions uh, if you have some and if you have time. Um, Dr. Pena, there is one question that it's, what's the role of the pediatrician, the gastroenterologist, and the pediatric surgeon in bowel management? Oh, so um, there are pediatricians that are interested in doing the bowel management, but they have to learn that because it's not just decide to do it. The, the bowel, as a, you are going to talk about bowel management, right? Yes. So, as you will hear from Dr. Bishop, bowel management requires a lot of time and dedication. So you need, if you, you need a, a, obviously the pediatrician is very important, but you need an inspired pediatrician and you need an inspired nurse, sensitive, inspired pediatrician and nurse. Gastroenterologists, the same thing. We need the gastroenterologists. We, we work together with them, but they don't do it directly. So, if they do it, congratulations, that would be great. So this is, is, is an open world and we will, will feel very great if they decide to collaborate in the bowel management. But so far, as far as I know, the dedicated bowel management, which is different from prescribing an enema. Pediatricians and gastroenterologists sometimes prescribe an enema and that's it. But that's not bowel management. Bowel management, as you will hear from Dr. Bishop, something much more than that. Just one quick question, because we are running out of time. Is there any evidence of variation in anorectal malformation incidence rate across countries, continents, industrialized versus developing countries? That's an excellent question, but I don't have the answer. But I can tell you that the poor countries have many more patients than the so-called developed countries, but we don't know if there is something something genetic, something related, or lack of, uh, of prenatal care. Or, or, but the fact is that, that poor people has more unrectal malformation, but that we don't know why. Thank you very much, Dr. Peña. There are some beautiful messages thanking you, wishing you good holidays. I took pictures of them and I'll show you later. Thank you. We're going to now invite our next speak speaker, Dr. Dan Wood. And Dr. Peña already 
somehow introduce him already. He is the transition of care urologist, and we are very fortunate that he works here with us and can see all of our adult patients or adolescent patients with anorectal malformation that are ready to transition. Welcome, Dr. Wood. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly, yep. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I apologize slightly for my background. I'm about to start running a meeting of my own. Uh, I'm in, in the middle of an enormous ballroom, and I thought this was the prettiest background I could choose. <laughs> so I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about um, what transition really means. Uh, I'm also going to show you some of the data from work that we've done at Children's Colorado looking at outcomes uh, from across the world for these patients to give you some perspective uh, about the long term, which is really a large part of the job that myself and my team are involved in. Ah, I can't seem to move the slide forward. Let's try from here. Here we go. So it's really important to understand what transition means. A lot of people associate transition with meaning that it's just simply a move from one set of doctors to another set of doctors uh, who are going to continue your care. It's much, much more than that. Uh, that's imp uh, maybe an important component. But the real meaning of transition, the, the basis for, for transition, is teaching a young patient or a young adult to learn how to become independent in their own health care. That's so that they understand their diagnosis, understand some aspects of the treatment they've had. They can start to make their own decisions about uh, treatments for the future. Uh, and they can do other things like schedule their own appointments, order their own medications and other things that they need to do as part of their health care. So it's all about uh, getting somebody ready for that. Transfer, which is that move from one doctor or one team to another team, um, may well be part of that, not necessarily in all environments, but it, it can be for some. So it's important to understand that distinction when we, when we come to talk about it. So why is that important? Why does that matter? Why can't they just carry on with their pediatric doctors uh, and just um, with, the, with the same team that they've always known? Well, there are lots of challenges to keeping increasing numbers of patients within any hospital. But if a children's hospital is full of adult patients, uh, then it's got no room to take on the new patients uh, to provide the expert care that you've just heard about, for instance, from Dr. Pena. Um, if transition is managed well, so they're well prepared and they know what they've got to do going forward, then actually patients will go forward with that. If it's not, then we can lose up to half of the patients overall. And everybody knows who's had children, particularly children who've grown up, that actually their priorities change as they get older. Uh, rather than talking about stuff that affects childhood and infancy, they're starting to talk about their own independence. What would happen if they get into a relationship? Will they be able to have sex? What privacy do they have as part of those conversations? And as part of that, then we need to be realistic about trying to help support both that young person and their family in managing that transition. So how appropriate it is for a family to be in the room having a discussion versus the individual themselves. Those are all part, important parts of the discussion. And it's important for us uh, as doctors to remember that healthcare is daunting to our patients and their parents. There's a huge amount of stuff that you guys organize and do every day uh, as patients and as parents. And actually thinking about how you're gonna manage stuff in a new environment is really important. So trying to help you all prepare for that uh, is really, really key as part of transition. So historically, healthcare was really in, well, two phases. There was pediatric urology or pediatric colorectal care and adult colorectal care. What we've tried to do over the course of my career is really to make that more seamless so that it's a constant flow through a healthcare system. So that if you're born on day one and you need treatment at day one, that you can be pretty well assured that as you get older and you grow up and become an adult, that there will be healthcare for you in much the same way as Dr. Pena was talking about just now. Now, the world's not perfect from that point of view yet, um, but it's something that teams are, are increasingly understanding and working very hard towards. And it's a philosophy that's developing and gaining a lot of traction in healthcare. There are lots of different ways that it can be done. So your pediatric doctor may be able to continue your care if they've got access uh, to an adult department, either um, within an integrated healthcare system or if they have to cross, cross the street uh, to go to another institution, they may be able to do it that way. It may be like in our system where 
I will come to uh, the children's hospital and see older patients with a view to moving them across under my care uh, to an adult hospital. There are also situations where um, patients are just referred out to a healthcare environment beyond paediatric centre that allows them to be looked after there. Transition really can be broken down into three components. Uh, and the three Ps is something that we've thought about at uh, Children's Hospital that allows it to be very straightforward for everybody to be able to understand. It's really important, and I was, as I was talking to you a moment ago, that uh, everybody is prepared for transition. These conversations can begin at day one of life if, if people are ready for those, um, but they develop and gradually the patient themselves, the young adult starts to take on a greater and greater role in those conversations so that when they're ready to move into an adult healthcare environment, they understand how they're going to negotiate a healthcare system. Ideally, every patient that reaches that point in their care and is going to move into an adult environment or onto another provider will have a plan for their care. So they'll understand what they need to do and anybody that's meeting them in the future will have that as a reference point. And then in an ideal world, we'd have a provider of the future, somebody uh, who each of those patients is going to be looked after. And there are lots of instances where that is happening. But as I said to you earlier, the world's not perfect and we're gradually developing more and more of those people in the adult world that are increasingly familiar with care of patients who've had treatment in childhood for conditions. There are all sorts of ways of doing it. This is just a schematic uh, that gives us an idea of when those conversations should start and how should they should develop. The detail of it doesn't really matter. The principle of it is that those conversations can begin when the child is relatively young. As I said, you as a parent can start to have those conversations about what a future might look like at any point. But then as a child grows and starts to become more interested in their own health care and their own life, for that matter, and what they're going to do within that, then those conversations can develop and they can have an increasingly concrete role. Should we just wait for uh, patients who've had big surgery in childhood with something that's affected them right from day one? Should we just wait until they have problems or complications and sort them out as they come along? And the answer to that is clearly no. Uh, and that's the problem with the fourth of those uh, those models, that if you happen to end up in a system that doesn't completely understand the type of surgery that you had and the condition that you were born with, then it's possible that either you as an individual will lose trust in that system because you recognize that the people you're dealing with don't completely understand what you're coming to them with, or that you'll not be prioritized in that system in the way that you should be because people don't completely understand all the subtleties of your condition. So we don't really want this situation to happen. What we'd like you to be is, is part of a system where you have ongoing care, a plan, somebody who knows how to look after you and can hope to hope, help to anticipate some of these problems and where possible try and prevent them or at the, the very least treat them when they do arise. And we know that if we have good transition, this is now quite an old paper, it's just over 12 years old, um, but we know that if we have healthcare transition, that actually people remain better engaged and there are probably better healthcare outcomes uh, associated with that. We need to be careful to make sure that we're producing the data and continue to support that um, in order to justify our place in the system. It sounds obvious that that should be part of anybody's care, but healthcare systems are surprisingly complex and sometimes we have to battle for our position to make sure patients get access to the care that they need. So we can do all sorts of things, uh, including that ongoing care, but we often educate our patients. So we can educate our patients. Um, this is a slide about spina bifida patients, so it's not necessarily relevant uh, to the audience today, but it's tremendously relevant in the type of work we do. And it gives you a really strong example of why education can be so important. So spina bifida patients do want to go on and do want to have a family. Well, we know that if we educate them that before they become pregnant, they take high dose folic acid, then actually we can reduce their risk of having an effective offspring um, by about half. That's tremendously important. It's not relevant to the cloaca patient, but there are other examples of education that we get involved in across the board. For instance, if you look at the right hand side of this slide, we know that if you have bowel incorporated into your urinary tract as part of a reconstruction, then you have a 57% chance of having a false, pos oh, false positive 
uh, urinary pregnancy test. And so educating patients about that and what tests are going to be right for them as they develop as part of their adult life is tremendously important. This encompasses aspects of our whole practice rather than any one particular condition, um, but our role is really important. We also know that collaboration works. Now, Children's Hospital are extremely good at doing that, at having multidisciplinary clinics. As urology, we take part in the colorectal clinic. We also take part in other multidisciplinary clinics. They're really important for putting together different areas of expertise so that we can make sure that a patient overall gets the care that they need. And we can have ongoing discussions about what might be the best approach. So we know by by looking at the work that's gone before us and by investing in the work that's going on now, the collaboration between medical teams work. Now that collaboration might look slightly different when you move into an adult hospital. They may not all be located in the same area, for instance, like a multidisciplinary clinic in children's hospital might be. However, that doesn't mean that's not going on and it's not recognized. And it's also something that people are actively developing. So when we think about a patient and we think about them going on into the rest of their adult life. What are the things that we hope to achieve? Well, primarily, of course, we want patients to be safe and healthy. We want them not to have um, complications, or if they do have complications, for them to be well managed. From their point of view, we want them to remain engaged with healthcare. And for us to do that, we need to have people who understand their condition, who can talk knowledgeably about their condition, and who, as I said, can provide the um, areas of care that they need. We also want them to have the best possible quality of life that they can. And the only way we can do that is to make sure that they have access to the health care that they need, or that's a big component of that. And we want them to have the best possible health care outcomes that they can. And the way that we can do that, there are many, many different ways of thinking about that, having a good care team that's there for now, but also making sure that we look at the data from people that have been looked, at in the, looked after in the past, understand what's happened to them so that we can both inform patients and parents as they get older, but also um, try and inform our, our paediatric colleagues so that they know what's happening and they can think about whether or not there's anything in their practice that, that they have done that's improved things or whether there are other things that they could do to improve things. That's how healthcare uh, and all sorts of other areas of life develop and go forward. So these are some data uh, about uh, uh, looking at data from across the world uh, about uh, some of the patient groups that uh, we've talked about today. So we know that it's really important to monitor the kidneys as patients get older, because we know um, that there are anomalies within the kidneys, not just in the perineal area, but also within the kidneys that we see. And those can affect around two thirds of women in, in the cloacal population. These are some of the examples of things that we see. So reflux, urine being pushed from the bladder back up to the kidneys, kidneys not forming correctly or being um, in the wrong location in the body, a single kidney as opposed to having two or a kidney that's slightly split, what's called a duplex kidney. And we can also see blockages to so the drainage of both kidneys, understanding that those things could exist is really important to you, but it's also important to us so that we can try to anticipate some of the problems that we see. And we know that in about up, up to half of patients, um, that that can result in a degree of um, chronic kidney disease, and we need to follow patients for that. Fortunately, the incidence of patients needing to progress to a renal transplant is very low, around 10 to 15 percent, but it's still there and we need to follow that. And you can see that only about 5% at 12 years were having uh, renal transplants. There are data out there that tell us, give us some idea of things that might predict that. So was there a longer channel in the first year of life when a child was born? Um, and are there any other indicators that we can see in the kidneys to help us anticipate those and look going forward? We know that when patients get older, their bladder function can suffer. And many patients... Um, will have a bladder that's underactive that doesn't empty completely uh, as we would like it to do. That affects around two thirds of patients. And again, you can see there may be a relationship between the way that everything was constructed at the time of birth, so a short or a long channel. Uh, and you can see that that gives us those give us data that help us to anticipate what we might look for. 
the vast majority of patients have great continent outcomes and these are what this is what some of these data show us and that's tremendously important to us we know that some patients will need to catheterize to empty their bladder and we can support that and make sure that that's that that's dealt with well for them but you can see there's a huge variation in data and nobody really knows whether that these data vary just because of the expertise, the number of patients that come through. But you've heard already from Dr. Pena that the aim of the profession overall is to, is to try and centralize work so that there is a greater volume of patients going through any one center and a development of expertise to try and make sure these outcomes are absolutely the best that they can be. Lots of, patient will, lots of patients will refi- require some form of bladder reconstruction in order to achieve that continence that we've talked about. So we might reconstruct the bladder neck to make it uh, a tighter bladder neck and improve continence. Very occasionally we have to close the bladder neck or we might make a bladder bigger. And if we've closed the bladder neck, we might need to drain that differently. So a Mitrofanov channel is a continent catheterizable channel that we can teach you to pass a catheter through. And it's a fantastic way of improving things for a patient. However, all of these things have um, have downsides to them too. A continent catheterizable channel is a fantastic thing and works very well for very many people. But we know that sometimes they have complications, and this is over the this is over a lifespan. This isn't something that happens uh, immediately. But knowing that you're part of an expert team that can manage these things is really important. We've learned over time that the appendix is best for making those channels. Um, but we can use pieces of um, small bowel to reconfigure and make those channels if we need to. And they can come up to the belly button or the right side of the tummy um, to to allow a catheter to be passed in. We know sometimes they they can leak or sometimes they can narrow. And there is no defined length of of life for one of these channels. Many, Many will last many, many years. Some have problems early on that can be resolved. Some need a surgical revision. Some of those can be done Um, using cameras and some of them need to be more surgical or or open in approach. So patients overall uh, recognize that having to do this is sometimes an inconvenience to them, but actually a surprising number, nearly half of patients are actually very satisfied with these channels if they have to have them. So these are real data. This is is what patients or uh, surgeons really find when they look at these for a long time. And we know that outcomes overall are extremely good. Up to 90% of patients will have fecal continence, um, with, with many reported to have excellent continence. Some uh, struggle more with that. But there are lots of things, and you've heard uh, from Dr. Pena a discussion about that, and you'll hear more from that later on in the presentations. And I'm not the expert on this. I'm just showing you the data uh, that we found by, as part of this study. Some patients will need to progress to a stoma. Some will be managed best by flushing their bowel to empty it of stool and keep themselves um, continent. And there are other adjuncts to that therapy um, that can be offered. We also know that patients in the long terms can have gynecological concerns. I think you've heard from Dr. Alanis earlier this morning, but up to two thirds will have normal menstruation. Some will have obstruction to that, and that will need to be dealt with, with forms of vaginal reconstruction that you can see listed below. The names don't matter. The fact is that those are things that we would discuss with you um, when you came to have surgery, if that was necessary. But we also know that very, very many of these patients want to go on to form uh, relationships, have partnerships, have families. Uh, We know that that's extremely important to them. And so these data are important to be able to say that up to two thirds of our patients will be sexually active. Many will engage in masturbation. Um, and 10% of patients will require some revision to their vaginal surgery based on the data that we found. We also know that as physicians, we need to think about the rest of their lives and how they're going to manage discussions around their peers, um, how they engage in long-term relationships, uh, and whether they have fears around um, uh, disclosure of their conditions and whether they would ever be bullied or picked upon for that. And we need to be aware of that so that we can support them as necessary if those challenges arise for them. Here's an important slide um, that that for many, many years, it was um, thought that it was going to be a real struggle for uh, patients with a cloacal anomaly to, to move on and have children. By looking at this review, 
there are a few cases, but there are a few cases uh, where we've seen 18 deliveries across the literature that have been reported. All of them, uh, except one, were delivered by cesarean section. So they need to be part of a team that has that available, a high risk obstetrician and shared care with a colorectal and a urology team that can support that as patients go through their life and start to think about these things that become important to them. So for men with uh, conditions such as Hirschsprung's or anorectal uh, malformations, we also did a study here at Children's looking at uh, some of the things that we that uh, we thought about were important as long term. Uh, we looked at their urological function and their and data related to their sexual function. Uh, we found up to half had urological concerns when we thought about it when we looked at that. Um, and some of that may be related to the necessity of surgery because uh, the organs are obviously all supplied by nerve and simply the nerves of the pelvis. And sometimes simply by having to move those, those nerves can be affected and that can subsequently affect function. But what we found that overall was that patients did extremely well. Some had increased urgency, so urinary urgency, the need to rush to the toilet, but a very, very small number, less than 5%. Um, had a urinary incontinence. And you can see that prior data suggested that was much, much higher. So that suggests that the ongoing treatment that work of Dr. Pena, Dr. Bischoff, and the expertise of the team that uh, you're meeting today has, has offered a huge amount of improvement for these patients going forward. You'll have heard about measurements such as the sacral ratio, and I've given you uh, just a diagram at the bottom to briefly explain that. Um, but we know that if that sacral ratio is lower, then urinary outcomes are better. We also know that we need to think about potential for renal failure or uh, chronic kidney disease. And there are predictive factors related to that as well. We know that for men in this situation or the, with these diagnoses, actually many of them are in stable relationships. Um, we don't know uh, all the data about them having children. We just know that in this particular survey, around a third of them reported having had children. Some of them report difficulties with ejaculation or needing fertility support, but they go on then to have um, successful families. Or, um, so these are important considerations and things that we can inform patients and parents and other doctors about. So when it comes to transition, um, we we know that there's a, a need for greater knowledge uh, amongst adult care providers, and many of us are working extremely hard to build that. I'm an adult trained urologist. I work as, as part of the children's team and part of the adult team um, because my role is specifically geared towards the transition of patients and moving them to, to an adult healthcare environment. That communication is key to make that successful. And you as parents and patients can be part of that. You can be advocates um, for yourselves and for your children to make sure that those communications are as clear as possible. Ask for a plan. Ask for what should be happening to your child or uh, young adult as they grow older. And then uh, seek access to good health, uh, adult health care. It is out there. It is difficult to find in some environments, but uh, I think that's an improving picture. So as a summary, um, we know that there are good urinary and faecal uh, outcomes uh, uh, that are achievable, and expertise plays a key part in that. Many patients who come through with these conditions will require um, some major surgical input. It's important to be prepared for that and to understand uh, the outcomes of that. Some patients, about two-thirds of them, will have a degree of bladder dysfunction, difficulty emptying their bladder. Uh, and that's important to understand because it's a realistic perspective and it means that that can be managed proactively and well. We know that patients go on to have very good sexual outcomes. Penetrative uh, intercourse is, um, is achievable for women, but they may need uh, an examination under anaesthetic as they moved into, into their teenage years. And they may need some um, surgery to improve um, vaginal stenosis, for instance. We also know that sexual function in men as they grow is um, is good overall. A, a number of patients will go on to conceive children and can have children um, delivered, many of them uh, needing to be delivered by a cesarean section. And part of that is because there, there are still some residual anomalies in the reproductive tract. It's important for us to know about the fact that chronic kidney disease can be an issue. And when it's needed, 
for us to engage or help our patients to engage uh, with nephrology experts or the medical kidney doctors. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been useful to you uh, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood, for this very comprehensive talk. I currently don't see any questions, which is a miracle. So if you have a question, please, oops, there is one. Someone who was born with imperforate anus and rectal urethral fistula underwent multiple surgeries on the pelvis, uh, like PSARP, urethroplasty. Does this surgeries affect fertility? You are muted. Or... Thank you. I beg your pardon. Um, I, I, the important thing to understand is with all of these situations that care is individualized. There isn't one rule that fits everybody because the answer is um, there is potential for fertility to have been affected, but we don't know in an individual case. We also know that there's, there's the possibility of achieve, achieving very good fertility. So without in assessing an individual and clearly knowing what has happened to them, uh, it's difficult to give you an exact answer about what any one person's um, fertility potential is going to be. What I would say is be seen by a team of experts, have that evaluated properly, uh, and then um, and then you'll know what those what those outcomes are going to be. Another question. After a male has hit puberty, when can you start testing for sexual function and what does this entail? So um, for sexual function, what we do is we ask patients um, really about are they having normal erections? Uh, as they get older, we'll ask about whether they've engaged uh, in intimacy with a partner and have they encountered any difficulties with that. Um, we have a very good uh, men's health um, uh, expert, uh, or two experts, sorry, uh, here um, in Denver, Colorado. And so if things don't seem straightforward, if things don't seem to be working well, then actually what we would do is get you involved with our men's health experts who would evaluate both uh, sexual and reproductive function. Another question, have you ever dealt with a case of a tragic penile urethra and a rectal urethral fistula? Uh, I mean, the answer is uh, yes. Um, but my situation is usually that I'm dealing with them when they're much, much older. Uh, and so the primary, the primary concerns have usually been resolved by Dr. Bischoff and the team uh, who've dealt with them at a much, much longer age, younger age. So we're usually helping them to manage uh, the way that their system has been set up and reconstructed into adulthood. What is the way process to do a smooth transition of care of these patients from the pediatric to adult facility? That's the $1 million question. So um, the answer is the three Ps that I gave you earlier. Um, so it's uh, preparation, preparation, preparation is the first thing. So making sure that both the child and the parents understand the condition, understand uh, the treatment, and can start to think about um, that young person's independence and role in their own health care. And then as that independence develops, they can start to talk about a plan for going forward, what, what needs they're going to have as an adult patient with an adult provider. And then the biggest challenge that I think we all recognize is finding a, um, a knowledgeable adult provider uh, that we can pass these patients on to. Um, and that varies hugely between different geographical locations, and different specialties. Uh, and there's a huge amount going on to, to improve that across the board. Um, and somebody's just written, this needs a great collaboration between two facilities. And you're absolutely correct. I completely agree with you. Uh, here in Denver, I'm privileged to be part of an institution that's working very actively um, to achieve that, that collaboration. Uh, and we seem to have a huge amount of momentum to help us with that. As I say, we're on a trajectory, it's not perfect yet. Other places won't be quite as lucky as us, um, but the hope is that by doing it well and setting ourselves up as one of the models of care, that other people will follow suit with time. 
Last question. How do you advise to develop such thing in a developing country? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, I've been very privileged to work, uh, to do work across the world uh, related to, to this particular type of um, specialty. Um, and it, it, comes, it comes down to a huge amount of energy from local providers understanding the need and wanting to develop this. But also, um, it, it, we have some responsibility in that to make sure that we try and help with providing educational opportunities so that providers can develop their expertise and start to think about how they want to deliver these services, not only um, to children, uh, but also to young adults and uh, adults as they progress through their life. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood, for your talk and for answering all the questions. I'm delighted. Thank you very much for inviting me. So now I'm going to invite our next speaker, that it's Dr. Luis de la Torre. He is well known for having created the technique, one of the techniques to repair patients with Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, and I'm lucky that he is my surgical partner. So welcome, Dr. de la Torre. Hello, Andrea. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you this morning, this afternoon, this night. I don't know where are you already. Uh, the idea today is just to give you information about Hirschsprung disease. Um, so let's start saying very important things. Number one. Hispron is uh, a rare disease, it's not a common disease. So if you have a if you are a patient with Hispron or you have a children, child with Hispron, uh, you need to know many things about it. Um, so let's start with the first slide. So number one. Hispron is a congenital problem. Congenital means that your um, youth as a patient or your child was born with this um, problem. Usually these patients, uh, when they are born in the first days of life, day one, day two, day three, they have something very common uh, that is confusing with constipation because the patient is not uh, having bowel movement, is not passing stool, is not passing gas. And also, as you can see in this image of this newborn, the belly is very distended. And also the patient can have a bilious emesis. Um, this is the most common clinical picture. If your child start to have constipation when he or she is two years of age, five years of age, and previously they were healthy, they were having regular bowel movements, they are not patients with his burn. I want to say it again. Because there are many patients with constipation, many means millions of patients with constipation. And usually, as we will see later in another uh, conference, you will see that the patient with constipation, when it's not treated, is not having a proper medical treatment, many physicians believe that this patient has Hirschsprung, even when they are two years, five or 10 years. And this is a big mistake. This is a big problem. Hirschsprung always is congenital. Constipation is, an, is something that we have over the months or over the years. It's an acquired problem. So this is very important. If you, have early constipation, probably you have Hispern. The other condition that is very important, and you already review uh, anorectal anomalies, anorectal malformation, et cetera, 
you need to find that the rectum is in the right position, in the right location, surrounded by all the sphincter. So the anus is normal. If you have a patient with normal anus, that means is not obstructed, is not occluded, no anorectal malformation, and the belly is distended and bilious emesis, most probably the patient has histone. Why is complicated to make the diagnosis of histone? Because usually 95 95% of the patients with Hirschsprung, they born without any other sign, any other thing in the body. 5% have other conditions like Down syndrome or other stigmas, other clinical features that we can say, mm, because it's not pooping, uh, this is a newborn, Oh, it's Down syndrome. Oh, probably has Hirschsprung. Okay. So, but this is only in 5, 10%. Most of these patients born beautiful. They don't have any other thing in the body that like a mark to say I am Hirschsprung. That is why it's very difficult to make clinically the diagnosis. But if you understand what is Hirschsprung, you will understand many things. So what is Hirschsprung? Hirschsprung, the, the word Hirschsprung is the last name of a pediatrician that described many, many years ago in, I won't say more than 100 years ago. Dr. Hirschsprung described a group of babies that they have constipation. And this group of babies pass away. All of them die with something that they call infection. When they did the autopsies in these babies many years ago, they found that the colon was very dilated, super dilated. It was a big colon. And in medicine, we call when something is big, we call mega. Mega means big. So that's why Hispron is also known as mega colon. Mega colon means just the colon is big. But there are many, many problems that produce a big colon. So not just because the colon is big, the patient is going to have Hispron. This is another confusing uh, terms and, and, and confusing in many physicians. So mega colon, mega rectum, mega whatever is something that means is big and that's it. So what is Hirschsprung? Hirschsprung is a congenital problem where the patient is was born without a very special cells that we have in all the bowel. These cells are the same cells that we have in the brain. In the brain, these cells are known as neurons. These neurons are nerve cells that we have millions in the brain. Well, the same type of cell, neurons, in the intestinal tract, we have also millions. You need to know that we have more neurons in the intestinal tract compared with the uh, uh, central nervous system, with the brain. Imagine how important is these cells. So in this particular problem, babies with Hirschsprung, they don't have these cells in the rectum. The rectum is the most distal portion of the intestinal tract. So the lack, the congenital absence of these ganglion cells, ganglion cells is the, the name of the neurons in the intestinal tract. So when you hear ganglion cells, it's because it's the neurons in the intestinal tract. 
So patients without ganglion cells in the rectum, the rectum is not working properly. What is the function of the rectum? So the rectum is a natural reservoir for poop. So the rectum is going to stretch and you will collect poop and then you will have a huge contraction and you will have a bowel movement. If you don't have these ganglion cells in the rectum, the rectum is going to be a very narrow reservoir and it's going to be spastic. It's not able to stretch. It's not able to be distended. So in this um, slide that you can see right now here in your screen, on the right side, you can see the rectum here. This is a rectum which is a stretch, a spastic, and it does not allow to open. But the proximal bowel, which is the left colon, is dilated. So we can say this is the megacolon related with hispron. So hispron is here. Okay. The lack of ganglion cells is known as aganglionosis. Aganglionosis. So this is aganglionic bowel, and this is a bowel with ganglion cells or normal ganglionic bowel. So the dilated portion is the normal bowel. And the distal portion is the sick portion. That's why this patient is not having bowel movement and the belly is distended. On the left side of this image, you can see the same thing, a very dilated colon. So it's the same, it's a mega colon. But the difference is that you cannot has anything that communicate the rectum with the left colon. And we call this mechanical obstruction. Mechanical obstruction means you cannot pass something. There is something that does not allow to introduce something. And his prune is a functional obstruction. It's a big difference. So in functional uh, 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 obstruction, the lumen of the bowel is open, as you can see, okay? So if a baby is born with his prune, the anus is normal, what's the next step? The next step is very easy. If I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this patient has his prune and I want to pass a catheter and I cannot, obtain gas or poop that was collected here, okay? This is a mechanical problem. But if I can, I'm able to pass a catheter here and I get meconium, poop, gas, whatever, most probably is hispron. We're very close to make the diagnosis. And this is what we call rectal irrigation. So this patient, this newborn was distended. The belly was very sick. She was throwing up bilious emesis. And then we said, mm, probably he's prone. So we introduced this catheter and we obtained poop. So if you compare this image versus this one, we can rule out mechanical obstruction. So the next step is the functional obstruction, which is the most common functional obstruction in the newborn in the large bowel or in the colon is his prune. So if you can introduce a catheter and you obtain poop or gas, wow, most probably is his prune. Rectal irrigation. This is an image, an animation, sorry. How is working, uh, uh, the rectal irrigation is working. So we introduce a catheter then we obtain the gas through these little holes. Then we move the catheter. And again, then we flush with 30 cc of warm saline. You can see how we are flushing. And then we do a clean out of the colon. And we call this rectal irrigation. Families. 
patient. Rectal irrigation is the medical treatment of Hirschsprung. Again, rectal irrigation is the medical treatment of Hirschsprung. If a newborn, I am able to do irrigation and the patient improve. In other words, we relieve the obstruction. The belly becomes normal. We treat the distension. The patient stops throwing up and he or she starts to tolerate uh, breastfeeding. Then the patient needs to continue with irrigation. We are not sure if the patient has his burn. Most probably has his burn. I'm going to show you another video how to do irrigation because this is the key part of this conference. Saline, Foley catheters, basins, 60 cc syringe, lubricant, KY is a good one, 60, 60 French or 24 French. It depends from the age, 16 French for babies. I want to say until one year of age and then 24. Then you can introduce the catheter and then you need to leave the catheter to drain all the poop and the gas. All the patients with Hirschsprung and all the parents that have a baby with Hirschsprung, they need to be expert doing irrigation. Once you get all the poop, then you can start to flush, as you can see in this video. So you need to get 20, 30, 40 cc's of warm saline and then flush slowly, then disconnect the syringe and again flush and disconnect. And how many times? 100, 1000, it doesn't matter. How many milliliters of saline we use? One liter, five liters, 10 liters, it doesn't matter. The goal is the irrigation is done, is finished only when their return is completely clear. So there is no amount because always everybody asks how many milliliters? No, there is no any amount for patient. When the return is clear, you can see now is green. So when we, we need to continue doing irrigations. This is very important. Now we have used right now eight liters of saline, flush, and the return is clear. So eight liters of saline, you remove the catheter and the irrigation procedure is done. You only need to wash with soap and water all the uh, supplies. You don't need to do a sterilization of these uh, catheters and syringe and the basin, wash your hands and the irrigation is done. E rectal irrigation is a life-saving procedure in patients with Hispron. It's the medical treatment before the pull-through, and is the medical treatment in patient after the pull-through that suffer post-operative obstructive symptoms like enterocolitis associated with Hispron. So, E, very important. Rectal irrigation in Hispron, everybody needs to be expert. Okay, so we already did the irrigation. The patient already improved. Then we don't have the diagnosis. We are not very sure if this baby has Hispron. But because we insert the catheter, we obtain a stool, we obtain meconium, we obtain gas. Okay, now we need to continue with irrigation. The gold standard to confirm 
that a patient has hysterone is not the, an X-ray, is not a contrast enema, is a rectal biopsy. So we need to obtain, we need to obtain a small specimen of the rectum, and we need to send this biopsy, this small piece of rectum, to pathology. And the pathologists, they need to do a lot of work to find these cells. If they don't found these ganglion cells, in many, many, many sections, I want to say at least 60 sections, then the patient has Hirschsprung. All the patients with Hirschsprung are the same? No, not all the patients with Hirschsprung are the same. The majority of the patient with Hirschsprung, the segment without ganglion cells, the aganglionic bowel, is the rectum and the sigmo. How, how many patients are born with this type of Hirschsprung? between 70 and 80%. So if we have 100 of patients with Hispron, 70 or 80 will have this type of Hispron. And in this patient, the irrigation is going to work very, very well. Then we have five, 10% of patients that is a long segment of bowel without ganglion cells could be the rectum, the sigmoid, and the left colon, or even a segment of the distal portion of the transverse colon. So we call this long segment hispron or long segment aganglionosis. And the other type of hispron is when the entire colon and even a small portion of the small bowel is aganglionic, and we call this total colonic aganglionosis. Fortunately, the good news is very few patients born with this type of hispron, and also this uh, type of hispron. What they have in common they have in common that all the rectum is a ganglionic. It doesn't matter if it's a long segment, short segment, or total colonic. So just if we think that the patient is a patient with probably hispron, it's very easy to make the diagnosis because the diagnosis is in the rectum. So we can use the anus as a little door, like a portal, to go into the rectum and obtain the biopsy. It doesn't matter if the patient has total colonic, long segment, short segments, rectosigmoid hispron. So the rectum is the organ that we need to study to confirm if the patient has hispron or not. This is just an X-ray to show you an impressive patient with hispron you don't know if this patient has any other condition. Probably this picture could be common to other problems. Even a patient with imperforated anus, you can see a picture like this. So the X-ray is can help to suspect hispron, but it is not going to make the diagnosis. Okay, so the rectal biopsy. In this illustration, you can see a specimen in the rectum. This is the rectum. The rectum has these four layers, the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis propria, and the adventitia. The ganglion cells, which are these ones, they live just in the submucosa and in the muscularis propria. So the rectal biopsy should include the submucosa. If the biopsy just is include the mucosa, be aware that this is a mistake. A very superficial biopsy, let's say the, the, the surgeon just take this portion. In this portion, there is no ganglion cells. If they send the biopsy to a pathologist without experience, the pathologists are going to say, this rectal biopsy 
in 16 sections, there is no ganglion cells. And it's going to be the diagnosis of Hirschsprung. But it's not true because the biopsy was very superficial. That's why it's kind of challenging sometimes to confirm Hirschsprung. And sometimes in some situations, the, somebody can create a big mistake. So be aware of that. So if the rectal biopsy include all the wall, and we call this the full thickness biopsy, then the pathologists are going to study the submucosa and the muscularis propria. Again, the most frequent, the most common type of hispron is this one. So in this conference, I'm just going to be more focused on this one, because if we have to talk about long segment and total colonic, it's going to be three or four hours conference. But many things are related with these two types of Hirschsprung. So the contrast enema is a radiological study that is very helpful because we can observe where is the spastic bowel and then the dilated bowel. So the segment where the bowel is dilated, we call this the transition zone. So if you look at this image, you can already are very familiar and you can say, oh, this is narrow and this is dilated. So the transition zone is in this point. So we start doing the study here. We continue injecting the contrast and then suddenly we have this dilation. So the contrast enema is very useful to determine if the patient has total colonic, long segment, or short segment histone. This is a contrast enema in a patient with a long segment. So this is the illustration just for reference, but you can understand x-rays. You can see the spastic rectum, sigmoid, and left colon, and then start to be dilated. And obviously, the small bowel. That's why you can see a lot of gas in the belly. And when you do, when we do a, a, a um, contrast enema, and we observe like a question mark, you can see the colon it takes the shape like a question mark, like this, right here, you know, is very suggestive that this patient has total colonic aganglionosis, as you can see, like a question mark. And this is the small bowel. All the patients with total colonic aganglionosis, they need an ileostomy. Ileostomy is an, an, an intestinal diversion that we do in the small bowel. And the patient needs to keep the ileostomy for three or four years until this patient achieve perfect urinary control during the day and at night. In other words, is the patient does not require diapers. He has perfect urinary control. When the patient has perfect urinary control, is the time to do the pull through in this patient with total colonic aganglionosis. Anatomical and technical considerations. I know that you are not surgeons, but I want to show you the basic aspect of these uh, operations, because at the end, you as a father, as a mother, as a patient, you need to know what type of um, procedure was performed in uh, your son, your daughter. When we take a patient to the OR to do a pull through, which is the generic name 
to repair a patient with his burn. Number one, we need to resect all the vowel without ganglion cells. Could be a small resection like 10 centimeters, could be a big resection, long resection like 30, 45 centimeters, or probably the entire colon if the patient was born with total colon. We call this the portion number one of the operation, which is the colectum. Then we need to do the pull through. The pull through means we need to take the bowel with the ganglion cells, and then we need to pull down the bowel and pass the bowel into the pelvis and then do a connection in the rectum in a very small space that we have to leave in the rectum above the anal canal. Probably this is too much technical for you, but these this concepts are very important. Why? Because we said we have to do a good pull through. Good pull through means the bowel needs to have ganglion cells. If the surgeons do, they perform the pull through in a, with bowel without ganglion cells, the patient will continue with his burn. Good irrigation. Irrigation means good blood supply. So the bowel needs to be alive, it needs to be red. If that not happen, then the patient is going to have complication. The most common is the hesence of the anastomosis and stenosis. And then the patient will require more and more and more operation. Surgeon need to be cautious in the blind zone. What is the blind zone? What is, what is blind zone? Blind zone, we call the blind zone, the pelvis. The pelvis is the, the, the in anatomy is where the, the bladder, the vagina, the many structures live. Well, we need to pass, the, we need to move through the pelvis, this bowel with ganglion cells. If we don't do this uh, uh, procedure, this step with love, with carefully, with experience, then some patients can have complications. They can have injuries in the urethra, in the bladder, in the vagina, fistulas, many problems. That's why we call be cautious in the blind zone. And then we have to do the most perfect anastomosis. Anastomosis means the connection between the bowel with ganglion cells with the rectum without ganglion cells. This connection or anastomosis should be perfect. If this anastomosis is not perfect, then between the sutures, between the stitches in between, poop can pass and then produce abscess, fistulas, stenosis, and many other complications. So that's why is the three main goals and challenge when we do an operation in a patient with his burn. There are many, many techniques and different approaches to do this operation. The first operation was described in Chicago in 1948 by Professor Orvar Swenson. In this operation, surgeons, they need to remove the rectum. Technically, the name is proctectomy. In other words, remove the entire rectum. All the rectum needs to be removed from the pelvis. Another technique was described in Paris by Dr. Duhamel in 1956. Patient with this technique, surgeons leave the rectum in place. They don't remove the rectum. The rectum, the rectum with, with his prone, without ganglion cells, are stay in place in the pelvis. Here, in this operation, the surgeons, 
they connect, they do the anastomosis of the bowel with ganglion cells in the posterior wall of the rectum. In this diagram, the black line, this one is the rectum, and this dotted line is the bowel with ganglion cells. So this is Hispron, this is normal ganglioni. This is the Duhamel operation. Another operation is an operation that we call the Suave operation. Because Dr. Franco Suave, he described this operation in 1960. Dr. Suave, he left the rectum in the pelvis, but he removed the inner layer of the rectum. The inner layer, if you remember when the, the slide, when we talk about uh, the rectal biopsy, the most superficial layer is the mucosa. Remember, if the mu and the mucosa doesn't have ganglion cells normally. Okay, so Dr. Suave removed this inner layer. Technically, we call this mucosectomy because we remove the mucosa. So the black lane, these lines right here is the rectum. This is the sacrum, this is posterior. And then he left the rectum, the nuret, in other words, without mucosa, just the muscular layer, the muscular cuff. And then he introduced the normal ganglionic bowel inside this denuded or rectal cuff, muscular cuff. That's why the name of this technique is also known as endorectal. Endorectal means inside the rectum. These are the three most common techniques to do this operation, to repair patient with histron. Then in the 90s, when the minimal invasive instruments called laparoscopic start to be used by pediatric surgeon, the abdominal approach, the abdominal uh, part of the operation could be done without open surgery. So do, then start to do operation with laparoscopic approach. And then in 1996, with another colleague from Mexico, we start to do a operation using just the anus. So using the anus, and we call this the transanal approach, we were able to perform the colectomy, we were able to do the pull through, and we were able to do the connection of the bowel with ganglion cells with the adequate uh, distal bowel. And then we call this the transanal pull through. And we don't use any incision in the belly. We don't use laparoscopic approach, just the transanal approach. So we can do this operation with colostomy, then the pull through, and then we close the colostomy. And we call this the three stage pull through or three steps operations. Also, we can do a colostomy or ileostomy, and then the pull through and no more colostomies or ileostomies. And we call these two stages pull through. And then we can do now the operation in just one, we can repair his just in one operation. And we call this one stage or primary, primary pull through. A primary pull through means the patient will not require before or after the pull through an stoma, a colostomy or ileostomy. So imagine now the treatment of this a rare disease has different types of techniques and different approaches. 
with different stages. So you can have a primary pull through with Swenson, a primary pull through with Swenson using the transanal approach. You can have a primary pull through with Swenson using laparoscopic approach, which is different. Or you can have three stages with Duhamel, with Suave, with Swenson. In other words, is a mix today. That's why when the parents call to the colorectal center, we want to hear from you more information because the complications or the outcome sometimes is different based on the technique, the approach, and the number of surgeries. So again, laparoscopic, transanal, or laparotomy. Two stages, one stage, whatever. And this is the big menu today to repair patient with Hispran disease. And then what happened? Then what happened? We can do the most beautiful operation. We can do the perfect primary pull through. We can do a very good connection. 70%. 70% of the patient with Hispern, all the patient with Hispern, I'm talking short segment, long segment, and total colonic, 70%, they will need follow-up for the next 100 years. Why? Because this 70% of the patient will have some problems. We are not able to cure, to resolve 100% Hispern in all the patients. It depends from the age, how is the patient, the type of surgery. And we can say probably 50% of the patient could be cured, could be after the pull through, they don't require anything. But in general, we, just, we say 70%, they will require something. While the patient is on diapers, usually some patients have diarrheas, three, four, five, eight bowel movements a day, some diaper rash, some patients have constipation, some patients have enterocolitis and require irrigation every month, every three months, every day. It's very complex patient to patient. But when the patient is to be poorly trained, toilet trained, they need to stop using diapers because they need to go to school. Wow is the time when the patient start, or the parents start to look for more help. This patient require a very good approach, very good workup to make a good, to define the most accurate functional problem. What problems we have, we can diagnose in patient with Hispern after the pull through. Well, patients with bowel control, so the patient is able to, to hold the bowel movement, but sometimes the colon, the residual colon works normal. Sometimes works very fast and sometimes works very slow. So these three groups. Another group of patients, they don't have bowel control they have fecal incontinence. And these patients could have the colon with hypermotility, so very active, or the colon moves very slow. This is very important. So the results could be a happy colon, and I love to see happy colon because a happy colon makes a happy families, happy patients. When the, the colon is not happy, then the patient is going to be very sad with very dilated colons, is not able to pass gas or poop, and then he has an infection. That's why we call obstructive colitis with proliferation of bacteria. And this patient requires irrigation, irrigation and uh, antibiotics. Patients with fecal incontinence like this, 
The colon sometimes moves very fast, and you can see this colon has accidents, involuntary bowel movements, or constipation. Complications. I am not going to talk about complication, but this is just a short list of complications after the pull through. The majority of these complications are preventable. This is the sad news. This is the bad news. Okay. One that is not preventable, even after a perfect surgery, is the enterocolitis. This is not preventable. This picture is the picture of the anus, of the anal canal. This is the skin, the anoderm, and the mucosa. We need to preserve these elements. If we lost these elements, the patient is going to have fecal incontinence. As you can see in this picture, this is the skin, but you don't see these structures that we call the dented line or the pectinate zone. In this patient, we found there is no pectinate zone. This patient will have fecal incontinence forever. And he's going to use diapers, pull-ups, pads, whatever. The good news, if a patient with fecal incontinence after a pull-through for his disease, we have a very good bowel management program for these patients and they can stay clean without accidents 24 hours a day. And we are going to talk later about this bowel management. This is another picture just to show you an stenosis and a structure of the anastomosis of the connection. This patient will require a reoperation this is a patient with enterocolitis. The patient had a very good pull through, very good surgeon, very good pathologist, but unfortunately, we don't know. We have some clues why this patient have this enterocolitis, but this patient will require what? Guess what? Correct, everybody knows, irrigation and antibiotics. The most common antibiotics in patients with obstructive enterocolitis is metronidazole or Flagyl. We use this for a month and then we stop the irrigation. We have a plan for these patients. Once we stop the irrigation, usually the patient start to have bowel movements again and no more problems. But some patients have recurrent colitis. We stop the irrigation and again colitis. Stop the irrigation and again enterocolitis. In this patient, it's mandatory to take the patient to the OR again. And then under anesthesia, we need to do an anorectal exam to evaluate the anal canal. How is the anastomosis, the connection? We need to take a biopsy of the pull through. The pull through we don't we don't call rectum because the rectum was removed in all these cases. So we need to take a biopsy of the new rectum or neo rectum. This is a workup, and then we'll find out the next step. Many parents write letters about Botox. Botox is a toxin that produce uh, denervation of uh, the muscle. So the communication between mm -hmm. the nerves and the muscle is through, a, let's say, a molecule. So the nerve sends something, let's say a molecule, and is walking and then stimulate this muscle. So this communication between the nerves and the muscle is allowed because the nerve send these signs using a special substance. Okay. If we place Botox in this site, this communication is lost. We stop the communication between the muscle and the nerves. 
and that is going to allow to open the anal canal, to relax the anal canal. So Botox is something that is helpful, like an adjuvant in patients with recurrent enterocolitis. But it's very important to rule out other mechanical problems, which is very common. Twist of the pultru, stenosis of the anastomosis, uh, pultrus without ganglion cells, and many others. So before the patient uh, con be considered a good candidate for Botox, we need to rule out many other things. This is my email, luis.delatorre at Children's Colorado. I really appreciate your time. If you have any question, you can reach me and I will be very happy to answer all your questions, all your concerns. Thank you very much. I don't Thank know. Thank you, if we Dr. Have De La Torre. Questions. Yes, there are questions. The first one is Can Hirschsprung disease be in the rectum and ultra short Hirschsprung disease? As the rectal sigmoid biopsy proved to be positive for ganglion cells. The, the ultra short segment, this prune does not exist. So I want to be very clear. All the patients with his prune, they don't have ganglion cells. And the rectum always is affected. Ultra short segment is a concept that was created by other physicians. And they say, it's a patient with constipation with ganglion cells in the rectum. To me, no makes sense to call ultra short segment. So ultra short segment, please forget about it. Uh, is something that does not exist like Hirschsprung in the concept of the lack of ganglion cells. How to manage fecal incontinence after surgery for Hirschsprung disease? Dr. Andrea Bishop is going to explain you how to manage fecal incontinence. Yes, we have a very good program <laughs> to manage this patient. So Andrea is going to explain <laughs> you this. <laughs> She's going to explain this, correct? Correct. Um, I plan to ask this later, but since you brought up flagell, in children with imperforate anus, post PSARP and colostomy closure. How common are C. diff associations with these surgeries and colitis? We have been going through recurrence after recurrence of C. diff colonization for the past six months. C. diff uh, means uh, Clostridium difficile. That's C. diff. Uh, and C. diff is a, is, is a bug that it is not a normal, usually is not normal in humans. Uh, patients with uh, that were submitted to many antibiotics and they have been in the hospitals, they can uh, have this uh, colonization. They said, let's say they get this bacteria and then the bacteria is going to live in the colon. Sometimes this bacteria is not going to produce any problem. And we call this, uh, the patient has just C. diff. But in some patients, C. diff can produce inflammation of the colon, so colitis, that could be mild, moderate, or severe, even perforation of the colon. Uh, I recommend to uh, reach your uh, ID physician, infection disease physician, to follow the protocols because sometimes we don't need to do anything. Uh, that's why I don't want to answer something wrong. Um, there is an there was another question that just disappeared. Is if uh. Can you damage the anal canal doing a rectal biopsy? No, I don't. Somebody can do it. 
but we are, I want to say, we are expert doing rectal biopsies. To do the rectal biopsies, you can do with a device that is, uh, we call the suction rectal device or open biopsy using the transanal approach. If we are going to do like an open uh, biopsy, we use a special retractor that protect the entire uh, anal canal, all the circumference. Because the biopsy is from the rectum, we are not causing any damage in the anal canal. If the surgeon or the physician wants to take the biopsy and the biopsy is so low, is very close to the anus, yes, the biopsy can produce damage of the anal canal, but it's very uncommon in the biopsy. Next question, do you preconize dilations after Hirschsprung disease operation? I do. Uh, there are two types of surgeons in the world. Some surgeons decide to do like an evaluation, clinical evaluation, two, three, four, five weeks after the pull through. They do a digital exam and based on their experience, they decide to do or not to do uh, dilations. My uh, practice is to do dilations after the pull through two, three weeks after the pull through. I don't have any patient with uh, stenosis, but I have seen patients with stenosis without dilations. I don't know if the dilation uh, prevent stenosis in those patients because we don't have any study to compare what patients were dilated and what patients were not dilated. Because the most common cause of uh, stenosis of the anastomosis is um, a pull through with ischemia, as I already explained. Next question. Um, if a patient has short segment and is now three years old, uh, starting to respond to potty train on Senna, do you know the average age a child with Hirschsprung might become potty trained? I want to say that the patient with his burn, uh, remember, to be body trained, you need to have the rectum, okay? Because the rectum is the natural reservoir and the sigmoid. And all the patients with his burn, they don't have rectum. So they, they don't have this natural reservoir. So they cannot collect the same amount of poop as a, as a normal kid because the neorectum is small compared with the rectum, because the rectum, the function of the rectum is to collect the poop and it allows to stretch and collect and collect. At some point, you have a bowel movement. The patient with his the patient with his they don't have rectum. So we cannot ask the patient to have the same function of the rectum because they don't have uh, this part of the intestinal tract. So in short, no. We give a little more time for this patient to be poly trained. I want to say probably one more year, probably. And I think the last question is how to do the dilations. The, the dilations is, um, I'm not sure if you talk about dilations in the conference about uh, anorectal malformation in the morning? Not really. I okay. There were questions and I answered, but I didn't show our protocol. Okay, so the, the anorectal dilation means uh, there is a, a special device or something that we call Hagar dilators. And these Hagar dilators came in different numbers. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever. That means is the size, if I say Hegar number 10, that means the diameter is 10 millimeters, 10 millimeters. A newborn should have the diameter of 12 millimeters. 
then a patient that is five months, they need he or she needs a hair number 13. Patient with nine months, they need the number 14. After one year of age is the number 15. So we start to do the dilation probably, let's say if we start with the number 11, we do the dilation in the morning, meet uh, three times a day for a week. And then we increase one millimeter. So 11, 12, 13. If the patient is six months, we don't need to increase the dilator because the, 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 for the age, the number 13 is perfect. It's how we do the dilation. We have a, a special protocol. If you have more con questions about the protocol, we can send you, write an email and we can send you our protocol. Last question, did fecal incontinence due to damage of the anal sphincter by hypertraction to have a good exposure during pull through, is it reversible if the surgeon stretches too much and the patient has fecal incontinence? If the surgeon did a overstretch of the sphincter using a transanal approach and the anal canal has some damage, I want to say is irreversible. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. De La Torre. Don't go Thank very you. far because my talk is fast. Okay. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about um, bowel management for the treatment of fecal incontinence. Let me just make my screen big here. Are you seeing double slides or just one? Ray? Just seeing just one, just one. Perfect. Okay, so again, when we use the term bowel management, usually it refers of the management of constipation. That's what Dr. De La Torre is going to talk about. The management of fecal incontinence. That's what I am going to talk about. And in fecal incontinence, there is also two group of patients, patients that have tendency to diarrhea and no bowel control, tendency to constipation and no bowel control. So when talking about anorectal malformation, Hirschsprung disease, we like to say there are two public enemies, constipation and diarrhea. Those patients need the right consistency in order to feel the bowel movement and make it to the toilet. So in patients with Hirschsprung disease, as Dr. De La Torre mentioned, what usually defines continence is the right operation and preservation of the anal canal. If the patient has damaged anal canal, this patient will suffer from fecal incontinence. In patients with anorectal malformation, what determines the chances for bowel control is the type of malformation, the quality of the sacrum, and having received a technically correct operation. Still, when all those criteria are met, there are some patients that have what we call borderline bowel control. So patients who have bowel control majority of them will need laxatives, and that's the talk that Dr. De La Torre will give after mine. Patients who have fecal incontinence, that's the group we're talking right now, they will need enemas. So parents often ask, what is the right age to start enemas? And as I mentioned before, we want our patients to be out of diapers at the same age that other kids around them are out of diapers, either because they successfully toilet trained or because we are going to keep them artificially clean for a stool with daily enemas. So the age of toilet training varies a lot between countries. I would say in the United States, the deadline is kindergarten. When kids enter kindergarten, majority of kids here go to public school. And one of the requirements 
is that they have to be toilet trained. So that's the deadline happens usually between four and five years of age. Majority of the countries, we are talking about being potty trained between age three and age five. So the concept of giving an enema is very simple. We use a Foley catheter that we insert into the rectum, we inflate the balloon, and we pull back so it acts as a tampon. Then we're going to infuse the solution that the doctor will prescribe you. We want to hold the solution between 5 and 10 minutes, and then we're going to deflate the balloon and sit in the toilet for the remaining of the hour. We want the entire process to take one hour, not more than that. I know one hour is a lot, but if you think that you're dedicating one hour to the bathroom and then not having to think about stool, we think it's manageable and you can use this time in a productive way. And the goal is that after the enema, you will have a clean rectum and left colon because it takes 24 hours for the stool in the right colon to reach the rectum again when it will be time to receive the other enema. Unfortunately, there is no magic. I know everybody comes here and they say, but you're just going to offer me an enema? I wish there was a magic way to make everybody clean, it's, but it's not magic. It does require trial and error, dedication, and we change the solution based on the patient and parent's report. If they are cleaning the underwear, if they passed a stool in between enemas, as well as the abdominal radiograph. Because after the animal, remember, we want the rectum and the left colon to be clean. If after the animal, you get an abdominal radiograph that shows a lot of stool, it means that the animal that we prescribed did not do its job. So we have to change the recipe. We start our bowel management always getting a contrast enema. That's when we inject a solution through the rectum and take radiographs and they show up like that so we can see the anatomy of your colon. For example, here we are seeing a very dilated colon. That usually indicates that this is a colon that moves very slowly. What that helps is that we need a big volume to clean that area but once we found the solution that cleaned that colon, usually that colon stays quiet without moving by itself. So it becomes easier for the patient to be clean in the underwear. On the other hand, we may see a contrast enema that looks like that, in which we have what we call a non-dilated colon. As you can imagine, it's much easier to clean this colon but the tricky portion is how do we keep this colon quiet, not moving in between enemas? Because this is a colon that has a tendency to be constantly moving. So this patient is the one that needs a small volume, but often needs medication to slow down the colon. And also we ask you to limit the amount of meals because there is something called the gastrocolic reflex. Every time we eat, the stomach sends a signal to the colon say, hey, it's time to move, there's more coming. So if we are constantly eating, we're constantly asking our colon to move. So in patients that have this tendency to move, we wanna keep it quiet. That's why we prefer to have three meals per day no snacks. I know it's very hard in children, but it's just creating that habit. What are the ingredients that we use in the enema? The base solution is the normal saline. The reason why we use normal saline is because our body is made of fluids and the fluids that we have in our body is very similar to normal saline. Many people do enemas with just water. Why we don't like to do enemas with just water? Because the function of the colon is to absorb water. 
So sometimes, in some cases, if you do just water, the colon just absorbs and nothing happens. In our case, we want the water, the normal saline, to mechanically help us get rid of all the stool. Because of that, we use normal saline with the hope that it won't be absorbed by the colon. And then we're going to use irritants that will make the bowel contract and expel the fecal material. So the ingredients that we use, the irritants that we use in that order, the main one that we use is liquid glycerin. Then if we need something else, we add castile soap. Castile soap is a very mild hand soap based off glycerin. It doesn't have smell or color. And if we need something else, then we're going to use the fleet the phosphate, the sodium phosphate. But we leave that as our last resource and I will say the majority of our patients do not need. We also are very careful in using fleet in patients that don't have perfect kidney function. We try to stay away from them. So here you can see why we are so obsessed about asking for abdominal radiograph. That's the only objective way for us to know if the enema worked and what's going on inside the abdomen. Even when as a parent or as a patient, you may think you had the best bowel movement of your life, that it has filled the toilet. If we see in the x-ray that it's filled with stool, it means it was not enough. We need an enema that cleans it better. So if you look careful at the x-ray, here is the spine, here is the heart, this is the lung, and this is the diaphragm that divides the lung from the abdomen. So here is the liver, uh, and here all this granulation is how solid poop, solid stool looks like in the x-ray. So here we can see a stool ball right here, this is stool, this is stool, this is stool, stool, and then it comes here, and this is all stool. So this is an abdominal radiograph that shows a lot of fecal material. Then we're going to prescribe the enema. So the patient did the enema, sat in the toilet, and is going to come for an abdominal radiograph. And this is the same patient. Now we can see when you see just black, it's just air. So the rectum is completely clean. The, the descending colon is completely clean. The transverse colon is completely clean. There is a tiny bit of stool here in the ascending colon, which is normal because that's where the small bowel dumps all the food. That's the entrance of the colon. So we will always see a little bit of stool in the right colon. So if this was my patient, I would be very proud because whatever I prescribed and whatever the parents did was perfect because we now have a clean rectum and left colon. Here's another example. So this granulation here is stool. This is some metallic uh, staplers. That means when they close the colostomy, they use staplers. We don't use that. But all this granulation here is stool. The black is just gas. And here we can see more stool. Now the same patient, and you can see again the metallic staplers. And now we see a completely clean abdominal radiograph. Remember, the black is just air. So we are not seeing stool. Again, if this patient is my patient, I would be very proud. And I would suspect that the patient is now clean in the underwear because the enema has completely cleaned the colon for stool. Now, what happens when you have a completely clean colon, but the patient is still passing stool in the underwear? That means we are dealing with a colon that moves very fast. So for if in that scenario, we can start the patient on Imodian or Loperamide to slow down the colon. A common mistake is that a patient comes with fecal incontinence and the doctor just prescribed the Imodian but doesn't clean the colon. 
So what happens? Yes, on the first day, the patient doesn't have accident, but then the patient starts accumulating stool, accumulating stool, and will have accidents shortly after. So that's why it's so important to see the abdominal radiograph to understand what is happening. And for some patients that have received a colostomy called for life, and this is common in patients with cloacal extrophy, for example, that have a short piece of colon, we like to do bowel management through the stoma. So we're going to pass the Foley catheter, do the enema. The patient has a massive evacuation in the bag. And then we want that colostomy bag to be completely empty or clean. And if that happens, it means the patient is a candidate to bring this stoma down as the anus. Because now the patient knows the effort that he or she will have to do on daily basis in order to be artificially clean for stool. And you probably have heard there are other devices. So that's the peristine, that's the Navina. Those are devices that pump the enema by pressure. So usually for most of our patients, when we do the Foley catheter and the balloon, we ask them to be laying down, the majority of them. And for as they get older, and if they don't want to lay down, those uh, machines allow them to be sitting in the toilet and pumping the solution by pressure. It's not by gravity because our way to give the enema, we place the bag higher up and it drains by gravity. Now, those machines, they are not the treatment for fecal incontinence. The treatment for fecal incontinence is finding the right solution that cleans the colon. So even we have patients that did not succeed with either of them for different reasons. So it's important that you are seen by a specialized center that can work with you until you have a system that works for you or your child. And once we have decided that enemas are the treatment for life, it's what the patient will need for life, Self-administration of rectal enemas is possible, but it's not as easy. So here is how we do the enemas. We call retrograde enemas because the solution enters by the rectum and then comes back through the rectum. As the patient gets older, if they want to be a little more independent, we can offer a Malone procedure. It's when we connect the appendix to the belly button in an almost invisible way. And then the patient sitting in the toilet will pass a very small catheter, an eight French feeding tube into the belly button. And then the patient will receive the enema in an antegrade enema and it comes out to the rectum. Very important to know that antegrade enemas are not better than retrograde enemas. Very important to know that the balloon is not the treatment for the fecal incontinence. The treatment for fecal incontinence is finding the right solution that clean the colon. Unfortunately, we receive many patients that have had Malone procedures and they come to us still dirty in the underwear because they don't have an enema solution that works. So our philosophy is that first we do enemas through the rectum, make sure the patient is clean, then we can offer a Malone procedure. And that's why our success rate with the Malone procedure is so high. And in some patients, they either don't have the appendix or the appendix have been used, for example, for a Mitrofanov to catheterize the bladder. So when that happens, we do a neoappendicostomy or a neomalone. And for that, we use a flap of the ascending colon. We pass the tube, we suture, and we connect this portion to the belly button. And the common myths 
that we see that parents agonize is that if my child is started on enema, he or she will never achieve voluntary bowel movements. This is a myth because it's important for the child to know how it feels to be clean. And in a patient that has borderline bowel control, if we separate urine from stool, meaning we do enemas, the patient is completely clean for stool, then the mother can work on toilet training for urine. And if they succeed, we can try to stop enemas and see if the child can achieve voluntary bowel movements without enemas. Some of them will need laxatives. So the fact that you start a patient on enema doesn't mean it will be enemas for life. For some patients, it will be because we know they have a very poor prognosis or they have a very poor sacral ratio, but it's not for everybody. And the fact that you decided to start doesn't put them in that path forever. You can always stop and try to see if the patient has bowel control. The other myth, and that's the one the moms are very concerned, is if enemas will interfere with nutrition. Enemas are only infusing a solution in the colon. The colon doesn't absorb any nutrients. The colon only absorbs water. I'm sorry, there is a, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear, but there is a alarm, fire alarm here in the hospital. So enemas do not interfere with nutrition. And the final one is the assumption that fecal incontinence will get better as the child gets older. That is not true. If the patient has fecal incontinence, the fecal incontinence will persist. What happens, what happens is it's not uncommon for adults that have fecal incontinence to not eat throughout the day and then come at night and eat. So what happens is they start managing their fecal incontinence, but the fecal incontinence does not get better. And the final myth, sorry. Lower level, room A0630. And the final myth, as I mentioned, is to suspect that an antegrade enema is better than a retrograde enema. So the antegrade enema is just a different door to deliver the solution. It is not better than doing rectal enemas, but for most patients, they do feel that it's easier to achieve independence with an antegrade procedure but it's not that it's more effective, it's not faster, none of that. It doesn't clean the colon better because it's coming from above, none of that. So that's what I had for bowel management and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. So let me see. After surgeries, as a child with imperforate anus grow, how often do they need to get x-rays done to rule out that they are not backed up with constipation? So each, your physician should give you the protocol. My protocol, after I close the colostomy, I want an x-ray one month, three months, six months, and then every year. Constipation becomes more obvious once the baby starts on solid food. Once they are in, one, when they are in breast milk, it's very, it, we almost don't see it. Um, is it necessary to take some probiotics after the animal bowel management? That's a very good question. Unfortunately, in the literature, there's no consensus of what is a good probiotic. I think uh, science will evolve and maybe in the future we'll have an answer, but currently we don't. What do you suggest for a child who refuses to do an enema? They scream and fight. That's a very hard situation. And we are lucky to have our psychologist and social worker helping us. Um, it takes a village but it's important that they understand the benefit of the enema and that they want to do the treatment themselves. So I think if it's a 
most of our patients accept without problems, but for those with problems, we recur to the psychologist and social worker to help us. If babies start solid food, how to determine when it's a good time to start the laxatives? So that will guide you the consistency of the stool, but the golden rule is that patients should have bowel movements every day. They skip a day, you should be thinking constipation and the abdominal x-ray will confirm that. What is the protocol for when a child may be sick or have a flu? Uh, continue the enemas. So if a child is sick and is having diarrhea, unfortunately, the bowel management doesn't help. So we ask parents to keep them out of school until the diarrhea resolves. Um, my daughter, I think I answered most of the questions. Let me see if there is any other one. What are the steps for toilet training anorectal malformations boy before the enema? So we always say toilet training is, I, I'm a mom myself, and I would say toilet trained, when it's there, it happens. So trying to establish regularity, meals at the same time, uh, taking the child to the bathroom and showing, see mama, is in the potty. Do you want to use the potty? It's just encouraging in a positive way. And if it doesn't happen, my advice is start bowel management. And then every year during vacation, you can try to see if you can toilet train. Um, what is your view on fiber to manage fecal incontinence? So some patients do need the fiber to bulk the stool, but that's more when they are taking laxatives. For patients with enemas, it's very rare that we have to add fiber. I think I answered all the questions and we are on time for Dr. De La Torre to talk about constipation now. Dr. De La Torre, are you there? I am here. <clears throat> I'm here and ready. Perfect. Okay. Ready? Yep. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about constipation. Constipation is the most common problem in pediatrics. It's very, the most common problem in gastro in GI pediatrics. It's the most common problem in pediatric surgery. It's the most common problem in colorectal surgery. Constipation is a big spectrum. Constipation affects everybody in the world. It's billions and billions of humans with constipation. So, constipation can affect a newborn. As you can see in this image, this baby is not able to have bowel movement, is not passing gas, mom is is trying to use different formulas, suppositories, uh, rectal stimulation, many problems. This patient is older and this other is also older. These three kids have constipation. And I can show you pictures of adults. So constipation is very common. In this uh, animation, please pay attention in this animation, because I want to show you the normal function of the large bowel and the normal function of the most distal part of uh, the large bowel. So this is the right colon, transverse colon, left colon, sigmoid, and rectum. Remember, I told you, these segments are the natural reservoirs, okay? So let's go back. The poop is going to move from the right 
to the left, and then it's going to be storage in the rectum. Rectum sigmoid. Very important to have a bowel movement because you collect the poop in this area. Motility, normal motility, then is stretch, and then bowel movement. After a bowel movement, after a bowel movement, the rectum and the sigmoid should be clean. If you have a bowel movement and you have stool here and here and here, you are not emptying the rectum and the sigmoid completely and you have problems. You have constipation. So what is constipation? There are many definitions, many criteria, ROM1, ROM2, ROM3, ROM4, ROM whatever. One very practical, um, I want to say very practical uh, definition is the lack of regular bowel movements. Regular bowel movement means you have a bowel movement every day in the morning, but with every bowel movement, you clean out the rectum and the sigmoid. It's like a trash container. When the truck that collect the, the trash from your house, you want to clean completely this trash container. It's the same thing. Some patients have one bowel movement in the morning. Some patients have also another bowel movement at night. But every time they have a bowel movement, they have a complete clean out. Some patients can have one bowel movement every other day, every other day in a very regular way, every other day. And every time they have a bowel movement, the rectum and the sigmoid is clean. If they don't have a complete clean out, these patients have constipation. So, lack of regular bowel movements or incomplete elimination of the stool from the natural reservoirs for poop or both. Look in this animation, let me go back. So in this case, the patient already had a bowel movement. Mom is very happy because the diaper or the toilet is full of poop, a lot of poop, big poop big bowel movement and the parents and the patient are very happy but you are not you are not able to look inside if you have residual stool in this case after a bowel movement the stool is right here the, and we call this residual stool and the only way to confirm that the patient had residual stool after a bowel movement the only way is just very easy with an x-ray. So we take an x-ray, we look at the rectum and we say, hmm, there is a stool, there is poop in the rectum. The x-ray should be obtained after the bowel movement. So in this case, imagine this is a patient after a bowel movement, you take the x-ray and you are looking this. You, you can observe the residual stool. Perfect. Then over the time, look what happened. The poop in the rectum then is going to be dry because the mucosa of the rectum shh, take the water and make dry, big and hard the stool. And then the stool is going to produce an obstruction, mild, moderate or severe. Technically, we call this fecal impaction. Look what happened. After a bowel movement, three hours, eight hours, look how the poop changed. Now the poop is different. Now, look, you don't know how is inside the, 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 the patient. But if you take an x-ray right now, you will see this big, 
fecal impaction. It's not a complete obstruction because if you give Miralax to this patient, the Miralax is going to pass around this blockage. And then the patient is going to have something coming out from the anus and the parents believe this is poop, but it's not poop. It's Miralax or polyethylene glycol. In this X-ray, after a bowel movement, now you can identify very clear, look, this is poop. This patient has residual stool. This patient has constipation. Look the next patient. This X-ray is after a bowel movement. If you compare this one with this one, this has even more, even more bowel here, even more poop. So this patient has more constipation. This is an X-ray after a bowel movement, and you can see a lot of poop in the rectum, even stool balls, more constipation. Wow, in this image is impressive. After a bowel movement, you can see even more constipation. And this is a massive, gigantic constipation. So again, mild, moderate, severe, very dangerous and gigantic constipation. So you can understand now the spectrum of constipation. So based on the severity of the constipation is going to be the treatment. This is just a cartoon to show you how the colon is not happy, is sweating, is straining, is suffering, but no poop. This is constipation. This patient has a blockage, has a fecal impaction, but somebody prescribed polyethylene glycol and then the polyethylene glycol is going to be this one. But the real poop is inside the large bowel. If the patient has fecal impaction and you give laxatives, usually osmotic laxatives, then the patient is going to start to have accidents accidents are big accidents. And this is like a fecal incontinence because the patient cannot have control of these bowel movements. Because the patient, when we clean the, the rectum and we do a, a proper bowel management for constipation, then the patient recovered full bowel control. So we call this pseudo pseudo fecal incontinence, which means fake fecal incontinence. Again, a contrast tenema is very important <laughs> in these patients. Why is very important? Because the contrast enema is going to show the doctor how big is the rectum, how big is the trash container. So in this image, and I'm going to show you only one, you can see the white areas is just the contrast, is the dye, is the liquid that we use to, to make visible uh, the inside of the colon. So this is a stool ball, another one, another one, many stool balls in the rectum here. So this contrast tenema is very clear. This patient already has a big rectum. Remember, we talk about Hispron. This is a mega rectum because the rectum is big. The rectum is a pelvic organ and the pelvic is this area. Now the rectum is right here, is outside above the pelvis. So this patient is very sick. Usually, usually this happens when the patient is taking inadequate amount of laxative or inadequate type of laxative usually osmotic laxatives like polyethylene glycol. Constipation and pseudo fecal incontinence. Now you can understand the difference. 
Constipation is when a patient is not able to have a bowel movement and has residual stool and has fecal impaction and has abdominal pain and all the symptoms. Pseudofecal incontinence is the same patient, but is leaking, is leaking poop because the patient is, is taking um, uh, probably uh, Miralax. So how we treat the patient with constipation? It is very easy. Number one, we take an X-ray. If the X-ray shows residual stool after a bowel movement, this patient needs a clean out. They don't need laxatives. We cannot prescribe laxatives in patients with uh, fecal impaction. So imagine this is the X-ray after a bowel movement. Okay, the patient needs an enema. Already Andrea talked about the enemas. The patient has a good bowel movement and then boom, X-ray is clean. If the X-ray is clean, that's fine. We can start to give laxatives. Enema, as you already hear, is something that we use to put medication, uh, antibiotics or whatever in the rectum. The enema that we use is to produce a bowel movement. So we need to put in the rectum volume to distend, to enlarge the rectum a little bit, and then add something to stimulate the, the, the colon and the rectum and have a bowel movement. How we do the enemas? We use a foley catheter that has two ports, one syringe, because this syringe is going to be in this port, and in the other port is the enema back. Then we introduce the catheter in the rectum, and then we inflate the balloon using this port. This is the rectum with the catheter and the balloon. We pull out the catheter, and the balloon is going to create a plug. Then we run the, the enema in 15 minutes, as you can see in the clock, and then we deflate the balloon and the patient go to the toilet. This is the position that we recommend to do the enemas, depending on the age. The idea of this position is to take advantage of the gravity. We want that the enema goes as most proximal as we can. This is a very nice uh, animation, how to give an enema, the balloon of the foley, the plug, look the clock, 15 minutes, we give the enema, let's say 250 of saline and 20 of glycerin, then deflate the balloon. Now you can see how the colon start to work moving everything. The patient needs to stay on the toilet 20, uh, 45 minutes, one hour. And then the colon is clean. Perfect. So this is an enema. Then the clock starts to work. The patient goes to the school. He's playing at school. He's coming back. Lunch, dinner, ta -da -da, ta -da -da, and he's clean for 24 hours. And then in 24 hours, you can give another enema. Okay, you already did a good clean out. The patient is ready. The x-ray shows that the colon is clean. Then we are going to use laxative. The laxative that we use is an stimulant laxative. Once the patient is clean, remember, this is very important. If the patient has accident for many years, we want to keep the patient clean at least for one, two, three weeks. But the patient, they need to realize that they can stay clean. And then we give the laxatives. The name of the treatment is laxative trial because it's based on trial and error, trial and error, because there is no book in the world that is saying based on the size of the rectum, the age of the patient, the weight of the patient, if it's a male or female, it doesn't matter. Always we start with the amount of laxative and based on that, the next date we 
reassess and again and again and again until we found the amount of laxative to produce a good bowel movement. On the left side of the screen, there is an x-ray. This patient came for a bowel management week for a laxative trial. When we look at the x-ray, we say, we cannot give you laxatives, you need enemas, because if I give you laxatives, you will have abdominal pain, we are not going to be successful, you are going to throw up, you are going to be upset, and you are going to quit our bowel management program. Because we already know that if you have this x-ray, the laxative is not going to work. So this patient was on enemas for several days. I don't remember how many days, but finally, after many enemas is clean. It's the same patient because you can see here the stapler for a previous surgery. With this X-ray is the perfect time to start the laxative trial. What is the ideal laxative? Well, it's the laxative that we want to stimulate just the the reservoir, the rectum and the sigmoid, is the time of the bowel movement is predictable. The laxative does not produce pain. It tastes very well. It's, it, you can find in tablets, liquids, gummies, drops, in all presentations. And very important, guarantee no more accumulation of stool. This is the idea of laxative. The bad news is we don't have the idea laxative in the world. The good news is there is one laxative that is very close. It has the features very close to this one. We have four types of laxatives, fiber, softeners, osmotics, and a stimulant. The group of stimulant laxatives is the group that is very close to the idea laxative. In this group, the stimulant laxative that contain, that is made with the natural flowers is a natural medication that the name is Sena, is the best of the best. And we use our first line of treatment always include Sena. Trial and error, remember this is key to understand why we need to spend time doing the treatment. How many or how much laxative we guesstimate based on if the patient has a huge rectum, gigantic rectum, a small rectum, has five years with constipation, the patient has 20 years with constipation, guess on this history and the contrast enema, enema and everything, we guesstimate the amount of Sena, once a day, never give or take a laxative every eight hours. This is a big mistake. Laxative is just once a day at the same time. And every day we need to adjust until we found the amount of laxative. Let's say in this example, you decide to give four milliliters, four tablets, four whatever of laxative. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours, big bowel movement. Go to the x-ray. The x-ray show is clean. Good. This is adequate for this patient. So this patient needs four. The x-ray is clean, no accidents. The treatment is to take four tablets of Senna. Then the next patient is the brother, is the twin brother. Because in this brother, four was perfect, and the other one is the twin brother with the same colon, the same problem. We start with four, and look what happened. We get four, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bowel movements. And then he's still having more bowel movements, but not poop, just mucosy. So this is, for these twin brothers was too much. So not all the patients respond to the same amount of laxative. So the next patient is also the brothers because there were triplets. 
because in the first one, four was successful, I want to get four. And look what happened. We get four, and then in six hours, he has a bowel movement. Mom was very happy. And we said, okay, let's go and take an x-ray. Oh my God, residual stool. So he had a bowel movement, but residual stool. This patient need more, he needs more laxative. And finally, the other brother. Four was the magic number. No response. In 24 hours, no bowel movements. You don't need an x-ray because we already know that because in 24 hours, no bowel movement, the rectum is going to have poop. But this is the x-ray of the patient 24 hours after. So how to find the amount of laxative in every patient? is very easy. You start with your, any amount, let's say four, five, six, seven, two, whatever. In this example, we say four. Adequate means the patient is going to have good bowel movement, no residual stool. Excessive, many bowel movements. Inadequate, no response, the patient is going to need more laxative. So excessive, if you are, we were given four, in consequence, the patient needs three. And then again, reassess the next day because with three could be adequate now, could be excessive, then we'll, this patient will need a two or inadequate. So this patient will need 3.5. If the response is adequate, we need to keep the same amount. You don't need to change the amount of laxative. If it's inadequate or non-responsive, the patient needs five. We need to increase. If you start with three, we'll, the patient will need four. Because in this example, we are using four. In this example, we said, okay, this patient will need five. But first, an enema. Remember, you cannot increase the amount of laxative in a patient because we already know that the rectum has residual stool, hard, dry, and big. So this patient needs an enema and increase to five. And again, reassess the next day in 24 hours and see if five is adequate, continue with five. Excessive, you need to go to four and a half, 4.5. Inadequate, you need to give an enema and six. This is very easy. If you follow this rule, it's very easy. When to give the laxative? If you give the laxative, the Sena, in the afternoon, then the patient is going to poop usually at midnight, and we don't want to have patients pooping at midnight. So it's not a good idea. If you give the Sena at that time, then the patient is going to have a bowel movement, usually first time in the morning before school. So we usually use this in older children when they are ready to go to school. We give the, the medication at this time. If you don't want that the patient poop in the morning or the risk that the patient is going to poop at school in the morning, well, you can give the laxative in the morning or at noon and the patient is going to poop in the afternoon when the patient is at home, is how we do uh, this laxative trial. Why a patient with um, constipation have poop accidents? Because we use osmotic laxative. I put here po polyethylene glycol, but could be lactulose, could be whatever. This is just an animation again. This is the rectum full of poop. You give Miralax, the Miralax change the color for almost poop. And then you have, boom, one accident, then another accident. Because no bowel movement, you increase the Miralax or the whatever it is, osmotic. You give two or three times the doses or three times a day, and then you produce more accidents. 
Now you give more and more Miralax and more polyethylene glycol. Then you will have a bowel movement with real poop. But also you will have a huge bowel movement of polyethylene glycol, which is the brown liquid stool. So this is real poop, but this is polyethylene glycol. And then the parents are very happy because the diaper is full of poop. But if you take an x-ray, you will find the residual stool here. That's why we don't use osmotic laxative. AC is an anti-grade continent enema. When the patient needs an enema, we can do an operation that was already explained by Dr. Bishop about how we do uh, the difference between the rectal enema and the anti-grade enema. It's a very nice resource in patients that will need enemas for long, long time or all their life. I think Andrea explained this picture. This is a patient with an AC, with a tube, without the tube. I'm very happy to be here with you. If you have any question, please let me know. There are three questions. Okay. So the first one is, in a Hirschsprung patient, how do you tell the difference between fecal incontinence and pseudo incontinence? Usually the patient with Hirschsprung and involuntary bowel movements. Involuntary bowel movement means the patients have a bowel movement when and where is inadequate because the, pa the patient is not able to hold the bowel movement. He lost the control. In patient with Hispron, I want to say is almost inexistent. We don't have patients with pseudo fecal incontinence. Usually a patient with, fe with accidents and Hispron, almost all of them have true fecal incontinence. Other question, how often can I use x lax on my seven years old? Eclax, you can use every day, once a day. If a patient need a laxative, if a patient needs Sena, it's because the patient needs Sena. It's not because the patient becomes dependent of Sena. If a patient was is sick because he has diabetes and the patient needs a shot of insulin every day, is because the patient needs insulin for months, years, or all their life. We have patients taking Sena for more than 40 years without any problems. Many years ago, people believed that Sena can produce cancer. This is a big mistake. Sena is a safe, very safe medication so you can use Sena for years. So don't worry about the use of Sena. Another question, does the x lax hurt the kid? Is it painful? Sena is going to produce contractions in the colon. In a patient that was taking other types of laxatives like fiber or osmotic like lactulose, softeners, uh, polyethylene glycol, those laxatives are not going to stimulate the contraction of the colon. So the patient, they don't know these feelings. When you give a stimulant laxative, the patient is going to feel the contraction of the colon. So they can interpret it or, or feel this contraction like a pain in the belly. It's very important if the patient you are is using x lax or Sena, whatever, uh, be sure that the patient has a clean x-ray because if the patient has a fecal impaction, even mild or moderate, is going to have pain. Last question. Can Sena help to reduce the number of bowel movements? For example, if a child is having six to 10 bowel movements per day, can the Sena reduce that? I cannot say yes or not because I don't know why the patient is having six or seven bowel movements a day. But usually, if a patient 
let's say with constipation, because we're talking about constip in constipation, we are in the chapter of constipation. If a patient with constipation has seven bowel movements, it's because this patient has fecal impaction, usually. Last question. Are there other options other than enemas to get the full clean out? Yes. You can come to the hospital. You will be admitted. Then we are going to put an NG tube. And then we are going to give you go lightly. And then you are going to stay in the hospital one, two or three days. And then you will have probably a good clean up. Sometimes go lightly is not enough. We prefer the enemas because when a patient has a fecal impaction and the parent learn how to give enemas, if in the future, the patient for, for some reason forgot to take the Sena because he's on vacations or he's sick. And, and again, the patient has fecal impaction. The, the parents already know how to do enemas. So we say, okay, give an enema and restart the Sena. But yes, there is another way. At home, you cannot use the NG and pumps, special pumps to give the Golightly. That's why we don't recommend this one. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. De La Torre. We're going to move on. There are two more questions in the chat if you want to answer, uh, but I'm going to invite now Dr. Lara Jude Glossy, who is the psychologist of our center, and Christina Matkins, who is the social worker for our center. So welcome. We are seeing the presenter we mode. Well, we need to see the full presentation mode and also uh, please turn on mute yourself, please. All right. Are we good? You're yes. good. You're excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bischoff. Um, we are so happy you're able to join us here today. It's truly an honor for myself and Dr. Laura Judd Glossy, our team psychologist, to be presenting to you. Today, we're going to be talking about psychosocial support for patients with colorectal conditions and their families. So we know that fecal incontinence is challenging for everyone. It's challenging for the patient, it's challenging for the family members, it's challenging for everyone involved. We also know that fecal incontinence also comes with certain emotional and social difficulties. For example, the child who's having accidents often feels a high level of distress in when they have those accidents and when they occur. They may feel guilty or embarrassed especially if they're not aware that they have had an accident or passed some stool. They often feel like they're the only one who has this condition or feel different from others. This may also lead to a low self-esteem where they just feel badly about themselves overall and also a decreased quality of life due to some of the limits that they place on themselves or the family does about the activities that they can participate in. We also know there can be some social challenges. There is often um, a fine line for patients as well as for families and caregivers between trying to gain support, but also maintaining a child's privacy. Um, so for families, it can be difficult at times to determine who they can reach out to, who they can disclose about their child's condition, while also wanting to maintain the child's privacy. Because we know as soon as some information is shared with someone, you can't take that information back. So as a result of that, sometimes it's difficult for families to find others that they can really be honest or share this information with. This is also related to the idea that most colorectal conditions are invisible. You're not able to look at someone and tell that they have an anorectal malformation or Hirschsprungs or constipation. And so as a result, sometimes there's unrealistic expectations placed on a child um, who has a colorectal condition by others who really don't understand. Similarly, this lack of knowledge about the impact of the condition or treatment can, can make someone feel isolated. Sometimes we have well-meaning family members who just don't understand the extent of the constipation or the colorectal condition, and they make suggestions like, oh, just have some more uh, prune juice or something like that that may feel kind of invalidating to the family. 
And finally, it's very easy for both patients as well as family members to feel isolated and alone. Um, adding on to this, we know that there can be some particularly difficult, challenging medical aspects or medical cares that our patients have to um, go through. Often they're requiring rectal enemas or irrigations which can take a long time. Um, and often kids will tell me that they, they struggle when they have to spend an hour in the bathroom every day. Also sometimes remembering to take daily medication can be difficult um, and which kind of culminates in again, this potentially being a stigmatizing condition um, that is hard for people to kind of connect with others. My parents gave me the love and support I needed as a child and made me feel normal. My surgeon tried to give me a normal, healthy life, and I am grateful for these things. Your child's understanding and acceptance of their medical condition really begins with you. Children look to their parents and caregivers to help them understand their world and know how to respond and navigate situations. And we know that actions and words are incredibly powerful. You're going to be the first person or one of the first people in your child's life to help them learn about their condition and understand it. So how you talk with them about their about their condition and also to others is part of the foundation that they will build upon. So, for example, if a child hears you are so strong and brave, the child will reflect and often internalize this message. And later on, she or he might think, Wow, I've been through a lot, but I can be brave and get through it. This may help the child get through difficult times in the future. If a caregiver reflects to a child, everything is harder for you because of your medical condition. He or she may view the world as difficult and hard to overcome because of their medical condition. And this can certainly negatively impact their ability to persist in difficult times. I think one of the most important messages that we can teach our children is that their medical condition does not define them. They are not their diagnosis. We also know that knowledge is power and most children do better with information about what to expect. Always take into consideration, of course, their age and developmental level when explaining things to them. As you know, how you might explain, for example, an enema to a five-year-old is going to be different than explaining it to a typically developing 16-year-old. And Dr. Judd Glossy will be talking further about some of those strategies um, in working with young patients. Planning ahead and preparation of a new treatment plan is always helpful. Identifying coping strategies for your child can help to minimize stress for you and your child. We often will meet with parents ahead of time to help identify what might be a support to their child in the event the enema becomes distressing at any point. So this can be something as simple as having their favorite comfort items available, a favorite stuffed animal or blanket, the use of soothing music, fidget toys, using deep breathing techniques for relaxation, or even the use of screen time for distraction. And equally important though, is thinking about support you may need as a caregiver while you're providing the treatment. Oftentimes I recommend parents do what I call a practice run through, specifically if they're gonna start a new enema regimen, figuring out who's gonna be the best person to administer the enema and who might be best at supporting the patient. Either way, it's always helpful, I think, to anticipate um, how you might be a good support to your child or for yourself in the event things become distressing. Oh, sure. Um, throughout our presentation, we are going to be um, we're going to be providing quotes from some of our patients. Um, I think it's powerful to hear their voices throughout. Um, and so, so sure, sorry. Oh this, is oh, this is mine. Sorry. Um, find other parents who have children with anal rectal malformations. Connect with others and help each other. Find other children with this condition and connect your child with them. Acknowledge openly that your child needed special accommodations. So what helps caregivers succeed? I think we all know that connecting with others is essential in our ability to cope with challenging situations, including chronic medical conditions. Of course, support systems can take many forms from family members to friends to neighbors, faith community, therapists, and support groups. Technology has allowed caregivers, I think, to broaden their support systems even further, now connecting us through websites, social media support groups, and networks. 
We also know that self-care is critical to maintaining our overall mental, physical, and emotional health, and that one of the best ways we can take care of our children is by taking care of ourselves. However, this can be very difficult and sometimes easier said than done, when oftentimes parents are pouring all of their time and attention into caring for their child, in addition to managing work, relationships or marriage, um, other children in the home, as well as other stressors. However, children are very in tune to their parents, and if parental stress and worry is not managed and addressed, it can not only have a negative impact on the parent, but can also begin to have negatively impact their child. One of the things I often talk to parents about is many parents don't have an hour or two hours a day to take for themselves just to do something special or to self-care, but even taking five minutes a day um, or starting with five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day can make a significant difference. So taking that five minutes to just take a hot shower without interruption, read a favorite chapter in a book, um, just having some quiet time to yourself can help recharge you for the coming hour or two hours ahead of you. Many of our patients have multiple caregivers. Um, oftentimes there's extended family members who are helping day daycare providers and parents may be split in two different homes. Whether there is one caregiver or many caregivers, we know that it's essential for parents or, uh, or all caregivers involved to be um, consistent in the cares that are being provided across the settings, that they're coordinating with one another, and that everyone caring for the child is knowledgeable about their condition and the treatment regimen. Now, of course, we know there are cases where there may be high parental conflict and communication may be challenging. In those situations, we often recommend the use of a medical logbook. This is a book that you can pass back and forth um, during visits that would include pertinent information about your child's medical condition. Things like um, the time they received their medication or enema, um, what worked well that day? What were some of the challenges and how were you able to address those for your child? Giving that information back and forth is very helpful and can help promote consistency in care. If sometimes the, the medical logbooks are not successful and parental communication is just highly conflictual, oftentimes many of my parents used what's called a communication app. These oftentimes do have a fee associated with them, but allows parents to just simply um, text through an app about medical information relevant to their child, alleviating that face-to-face -face, um, communication that could be difficult. But you, yes. sorry. I wish I opened up to a doctor and or asked more questions about my condition when I was younger. I wish children had a say in the medical treatment we experienced. So as Christina mentioned, we thought it would be helpful just to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that we often recommend for kids of different ages when they're starting a new medical regimen or just continuing to do one that maybe is feeling somewhat difficult. The most important thing um, to start with from my perspective is really thinking about your child's age and developmental level and talking with them about what to expect. Even a toddler can understand the idea of kind of a first and a second or something like that. And so even a young child can understand the idea of taking medication to help them poop. And something, sometimes just something as simple as that will help them understand the why or the rationale behind a medical care. Keeping this in mind, we also wanna think about what's the appropriate language based on the child's age and development. So for example, a four or five-year-old may not know what a catheter is, but they probably know what a tube is or a straw or something like that. So in introducing a new medical condition or a new, excuse me, a new medical care, you can think about what are the language that you can use to help them understand it at their level. We also wanna think about how to involve your child in their medical cares. We have lots of little ones who help, like to help shake their bag um, and mix their glycerin and saline together or have other ways that they can be involved in gathering up supplies in preparation for an irrigation or an enema or a flush. Um, similarly, I find that it's most helpful to really try and combine an enjoyable and ideally distracting activity with a medical care, particularly if it's feeling difficult for your child. 
So for example, thinking about what is maybe one of their most preferred activities. For a lot of kids, that's technology, right? Watching a show, playing a game. And so what we often try and recommend is really pairing whatever that highly engaging activity is with the medical care that maybe feels a little difficult. So over time, sometimes the kids will really start to connect. When I do my enema, I get to watch my favorite show um, or I get to play my favorite game. And sometimes we have kids who honestly even look forward to their medical cares because they know they get to play that special game or watch that special show. Similarly, as Christina mentioned, thinking ahead of time about what coping strategies might be useful, especially if your child is struggling a little bit more with that medical care can be helpful. There's lots of ways to teach little ones deep breathing. Um, I sometimes like to use the idea of smelling a flower and then blowing out a candle or blowing off the, the leaves of the flower, something like that can be kind of a really simple visual way for kids to think about taking a deep breath in and then out. Also thinking about things like listening to music, what are some songs that they like can be helpful, use of timers and counting so kids have a sense of how long something will need to occur. For example, this can be helpful during dwell time, which a lot of kids will tell me kind of feels difficult because they're feeling some of that cramping um, and, and discomfort. If they can have a timer, that sometimes can help them understand that it's only five minutes and kind of count down. Also thinking about how to help the child kind of be involved in cooperating. For some kids, they do things like earn a sticker every time their body is safe when they're getting their enema. Um, or the idea of pairing the enema and then something that they really like afterwards through like a first then. First we do your enema, then we get to get cozy and read books together in our big, you know, warm chair together. Um, as Christina mentioned, the approach and the attitude that a parent or caregiver takes in doing a medical care directly impacts the child's ability to kind of tolerate that. So as much as you are able to maintain a positive and loving attitude is really important. And I think for a lot of our families, practicing ahead of time, as Christina mentioned, really helps you to be more confident in doing those medical cares, especially as you're just starting out. When we think about our teens, our adolescents, um, our goal for them is often helping them bridge that idea from childhood to adulthood in terms of their medical cares. So we want to think about how to give them some opportunities for independence. So first, this can look like help having them be involved in decision making. So what time of day do they want to do their Malone flush? Do they want to get up early and do it before school? Would they like to do it when they get home, knowing that they might have to miss out on an after school activity? Or would they like to do it right before bed? And I think for a lot of teens, they like being able to kind of have some of that choice and control. Um, it's often helpful for parents and caregivers to give teens an opportunity to meet with their providers, their doctors or surgeons that they're seeing individually for a few minutes during visits. It's possible that your teen might have questions that they feel uncomfortable asking in front of you. It may be things related to in intimacy or puberty or stuff like that, or it could just be a question about their body and whether their body is normal or you know questions like that. So I think always giving kids an opportunity to have a few minutes can be helpful if they're interested in that. And then finally, empowering them to take an active role in their medical cares. So are teens able to you know, do their flush independently? Things like that. And usually most kids don't start off doing their flush all by themselves, um, but how can you as a parent kind of work over time in helping them do more and more of their own cares? So by the time they're in middle adolescence, maybe they're able to do it on their own. We also know that for many teenagers, those social relationships are so key to their development. Um, and for kids and teens with colorectal conditions, sometimes it can be difficult to connect with others or find other kids who truly get it. So it can be helpful if you are aware of different camps that are out there or support groups for kids or things like that, so that our kids and teens can meet other people who do flushes or take medications or take care of their body in this way. And finally, um, the idea of self-advocacy. -advoc we want to make sure that our teenagers are familiar with their medical conditions, what their diagnoses are, what medications they're on, and what medical cares they have with the goal of when they move and transition to adult care at 18 or a little bit after, that they're confident in who they are, what conditions they have, and can share that information with providers.
We also thought it might be helpful to touch base a little bit about siblings. So many of the families that we see have more than one child, and we often, it's helpful to kind of plan ahead a little bit for them and their involvement. So every family is a little bit different. We have some families that siblings are around for all of the medical cares. For example, if the child is doing a Malone flush or doing an enema, the, the siblings are in the bathroom with them, maybe playing on that iPad together or doing a game. Um, for other patients, they may want some privacy um, from their siblings. And so it's helpful to kind of plan out ahead of time, what is the plan for the sibling during a flush or when the, the child needs to be in the bathroom stooling, you know, for a long period of time. It's also good just to take a few minutes to check in with siblings. How are they feeling? What questions do they have about what's going on? Um, sometimes siblings, you know, may not have a good sense of what's going on or maybe get confused or concerned. And so you can think about the siblings developmental level and what level of information is appropriate for them to know. It's always good to be direct um, with siblings about um, what information is okay to share outside of the family and what's really private. You know, we all can imagine a young child maybe sharing something about their brother or sister doing an enema at a restaurant or a time when a lot of people are around that might be uncomfortable for the patient. So having some of those conversations ahead of time to say, this is how we talk about the medical cares that your brother or sister does can be helpful. Um, finally, we actually often see that our siblings are a little bit jealous of our patients sometimes of the time that they have, you know, with a parent or caregiver. The patient may wish that they didn't have to do an enema, but the sibling may wish that in some ways they did because they'd be able to kind of have that special time with mom or dad. So sometimes thinking about even just having a few minutes once a week or something like that to have some special time with those siblings where maybe the affected child, the patient isn't around, can be helpful just to engage in an activity or play a game or something like that together. Advocacy in the various settings that you or your child will interact with is important. And when we talk about advocacy, we're talking about letting people know about your child and their needs, as well as your family needs in that specific setting. Advocacy can help avoid additional trauma, which can, which can cause further distress to your child. And of course, helping your child start to establish their own self-advocacy. This is often a lifelong process, but really begins as early as you're in clinic visits with your child. Um, you're often role modeling for them how to interact with their provider, questions to ask, and how to manage situations during the clinic visit or a hospitalization. Of course, also encouraging your children to ask questions and express their needs, helping them to find their voice, and always validating and normalizing their concerns and feelings. <clears throat> You know your child best and your knowledge is really critical to your child's medical care. Providers rely on information from parents to know what's working well and what's not. Sometimes it, parents can feel hesitant when talking with a provider because of their medical expertise or credentials. But remember that you have expertise too as your child's parent and truly you can both learn from one another. It's really a team effort in caring for your child's medical condition. Don't be afraid to ask questions. It's important for parents to feel as, that, as though they have all of the information they need. And it also enables you to ask questions that might come up for your child. Inform your medical team regarding your child's triggers and best ways to communicate information to your child. Knowing how your child responds to various situations can help the team prepare ahead of time for support. Um, for example, we will have parents share with us that a contrast enema can be really distressing for their child. So if we know that that's coming up, then we can partner ahead of time with our child life specialist colleague or with each other, or with the parent and child to help prepare ahead of time for some supportive strategies or coping strategies that can be put into place to help minimize the distress as much as possible. Discuss strategies for communicating with your child um, information that could be difficult. So for example, if your child is admitted in the hospital setting and you know it can be overwhelming to have multiple people in the room um, during rounds and explaining medical information, it's very appropriate to ask providers to pause and step out of the room to further discuss that information outside of the presence of your child. If it's difficult for you to ask questions or verbalize concerns, try rehearsing with family or friends. Make a list of questions you want to ask during their visit 
and prioritize those that are most important to you or your child. And don't be afraid to ask questions more than once. Sometimes there is so much information that having it repeated is really necessary and helpful as you're learning new medical information. Here in the United States, there are several different education plans or a couple primarily that provide academic supports for children with unique learning needs and accommodations in school for children with disabilities. We're gonna talk about a couple of those today. I think most importantly though is, is that it's important to become familiar with your child's rights and services within their school that can best support them and their needs both academically and medically. The first one I want to talk about is what's referred to as an Individual Education Plan or IEP. This is a document that addresses your child's unique learning issues and includes specific educational goals. Your child does need to go through testing and assessment to determine eligibility, but once they are determined to be eligible to receive special education services, those services are then outlined in an IEP for all of the teachers to support and utilize in their academic teaching of your child. Section 504 of the Rehabil Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is where we get what's called the name of the 504 plan. This guarantees rights to children with disabilities. 504 plans aim to decrease discrimination and provide equal opportunities by requiring schools to provide reasonable accommodations for children with disabilities. So children with colorectal conditions or constipation do qualify for 504 plans based on their medical diagnosis. And for example, an accommodation that we regularly will advocate for is that our patients are able to use the bathroom at any time during the day when needed. Um, we encourage you to partner with your schools. Um, and if you're having challenges in communicating your child's needs, we certainly recommend if there is a school social worker or psychologist on the team that you coordinate with them. If that is not something that's available, exploring in your community any resources, including educational advocates that can be of assistance to you and your child in that setting. Hmm. Hmm. Excuse me, sorry about that. Support for yourself and your children is, is absolutely important. For many parents, there is this delicate balance that Laura talked about between really wanting to maintain privacy around a private medical condition, but also knowing that you're, you and your child need support. So discussion with your partner or primary support systems can be helpful in trying to identify who feels safe for you to share that information with and who needs to know that information within your circle of friends or family to provide the support that you or your child might need. And of course, whenever possible and age appropriate, it's important to include your child in that discussion so that they have a voice in who has information about their medical condition, what information is shared, and also how it is, how it is shared with them. I also just wanted to review briefly kind of a three-step process that I use actively with patients um, around self-advocacy. Um, I feel like it's not uncommon that kids maybe after a surgery or um, even just, you know, missing school or something like that, they're worried, what's going to happen if someone asks me a question about my medical condition or my medical care? Um, and so we use a three-step process to work with kids to kind of practice and think about how to answer those kind of questions. So the first step is providing some kind of brief information about whatever that is, the medical condition, the medical care, things like that. The second point is to reassure them. And then the th third point is to redirect or kind of change the subject. So in kind of a real life situation, um, sometimes our kids, you know, will end up going to the nurse, whether it is to use the toilet there or to take some laxatives or things like that. So a peer may say to your child, why do you go to the nurse's office all the time? What do you do in there? And so the child could say something like, oh, I have to take some medicine in the nurse's office. But it's not a big deal. I'm, I'm feeling good. What do you want to play at recess? So again, it's a, a pretty quick three-step process of thinking and providing a little bit of information about what's going on medically, but then reassuring them and changing the subject. I should say that for some kids, they really don't feel comfortable sharing any information, and you could still use this step. 
you could say if, if it was the same question, why do you go to the nurse's office? It could say, you know, the child could say something like, oh, I just have to take care of something, but it's not a good deal, a big deal. What are you going to do after school today? Again, that you can work with your child and kind of practice this to think about what is the level of information that they feel comfortable sharing. It can be as much or as little as they want, but I find that when kids practice this, they feel more confident and using these three steps and talking to peers. We also just wanted to share a couple resources, both locally and nationally, um, related to families, you know, for patients and families with colorectal conditions. So many of you are probably aware of some of the Facebook groups that are out there. Dr. Bischoff runs one for her and Dr. Pena. We also have our colorectal support network that was started by one of our families. And then there's also a private group for adults with anorectal malformation or imperfect anus that I'm happy to connect if there's any adult patients out there that wanna reach out and, and join that group. Um, Dr. D has his own YouTube channel where he has videos and information. And there's also a number of different summer camps and other organizations that are out there. Youth Rally is a summer camp for kids 11 to 17. Um, that is one week every summer. Um, they alternate locations. And this summer in 2024, it's actually going to be outside of Denver in Boulder, Colorado, um, and is a really neat opportunity for kids who have a condition that affects their bowel and or bladder to come and meet other kids and just do fun activities. There's also something called the Serious Fun Network, which is a series of camps for kids with different medical conditions, um, including conditions of like GI conditions. So there's something called Roundup River Ranch, which is the local camp in our area, but the Serious Fun Network really is worldwide. And so no matter where you live, you could look in to see if there's a camp near you that might be a good fit for your child. Some other organizations that are um, supportive for families or patients with colorectal conditions include the Poulter Network, as well as the One in 5,000 Foundation. We do know that having a colorectal condition can be stressful for families and kids, especially if patients are dealing with other behavioral difficulties, things like anxiety or autism or ADHD. And so we know that sometimes kids just need extra support. So if you find yourself in that situation where you just feel like you need some extra support from a therapist or psychologist, please feel free to reach out to us. You can think about what behavioral health treatment might be available locally in your area. You may not have a colorectal center right there with a social worker or psychologist, but you may be able to find a clinician who has worked with a child with a medical condition before, or has worked with a child with kind of some behavioral needs and is willing to learn. Um, and we're always happy to help you find and connect with a clinician in your area. And then with your permission, share some information about their medical condition or some strategies that we recommend. Thank you so much for your attention. We are happy for you to reach out to us. If you have any questions, our information is there. Um, and if there are any questions in the chat, um, we're happy to answer those as well. Thank you very much. I always love to watch their lecture and I'm so grateful that they are in our team because I do believe our patients truly benefit from their support. So there is one mom that is very happy to see you both uh, <laughs> from Colombia. And there is another question, a child that had a late diagnosis at two years of age, doing dilations, it's been a hard time, and they are just about to have the colostomy closure. How can they avoid trauma on her? Okay. Um, I think, you know, toddlers can be, can, can certainly be a difficult age or an age that I think like to really exert their control. And I think you still can use some of the strategies that we talked about. Having kids understand, even as a two-year-old, what you're doing, you know, we're going to help make sure your body is healthy so the poop can come out. Something like that could be an age-appropriate way to talk with the kids about what's going on. And then at that age, a lot of distraction. And so thinking through, are there, whether it's through electronics, if it's a household that there's two caregivers, can one caregiver do the dilations and the other one do an activity with them? Something called sports casting is an idea I often recommend, where if you're watching, like a parent is watching a show or a video game or something with a child, talking about what's going on in the video with them pulls that child in even more, um, or doing something like singing that the kid has something that they can do actively. Um, I think the idea of 
decreasing trauma is really the more we can give kids opportunities for control, that they feel safe. Um, so any other suggestions, Christina? Yeah, so those are my main great. ideas. You're also welcome to reach out to us and we can talk more specifically about your situation if that would be helpful. Thank, thank you very much. And I think we're getting close to the end of this meeting. If there are any other general questions, I'm very thankful for everyone that joined and also for all the presenters that stayed on time and allowed time for questions immediately after the presentation. We usually add this block of question in case we don't have time during the presentations, but everybody was so efficient and uh, generous in having time for questions. So thank you all very much for being with us. We do believe in the power of parents, parents association, parents and patients education to improve care everywhere for everyone. If you have suggestions on what you would like to see on this meeting next year, please communicate to us because we do it for you. So on the in, on, on behalf of everyone from the International Center for Colorectal and Urogenital Care, me, Dr. De La Torre, Dr. Judd Glossy, Christina, the nurses, the admins, it's, it takes a village. And I'm just gonna ask Ray Evergan to turn on the camera. He's the man behind everything, the one that makes it happen um, and make sure. So we are very thankful for you for this collaboration, Ray. Thank you, everybody, and we wish everyone happy holidays. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Very, very happy holidays, everybody.